Tech PLC and past CEO of Slingo. Rich created a number, the number one iOS, Android, and Facebook social casino game with over 45 million monthly active users. Rich is available to answer any questions regarding the day-to-day -day operations of our digital gaming business. And finally, we are joined by Katie Peters, who is here representing FanDuel. Although she's only been on the job for six months at FanDuel, so we could give her a little bit of a break. She has a significant background in the digital space from her time at Google and Pandora. She can address any concerns you may have with respect to our partners at FanDuel. FanDuel is one of the leading sports tech entertainment companies in the US and has brought the brand's innovative sports betting and iGaming solutions to Connecticut. Before I turn this over to Ray, I wanna take this opportunity to thank again this committee our friends at the General Assembly, particularly in the Southeastern Connecticut delegation, Governor Lamont and members of his team, whom we've worked with tirelessly, the Department of Consumer Protection, who has worked through holidays, birthdays, weddings, and other important milestones to ensure that we could be here today to discuss the combined accomplishments on sports wagering and online gaming. For several years, we have been in discussions across multiple administrations over how best to operationalize online gaming and sports wagering, and to ensure that Connecticut remains at the forefront of this new gaming marketplace. As the regulations are being finalized, we have the opportunity to make improvements and address unforeseen issues to ensure that Connecticut remains a role model for the entire country. Thank you, Chuck. As Chuck said, I'm Ray Pino, CEO of Mohegan Gaming and Entertainment. I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today and share our thoughts on the historic partnership between our two governments. We marked an important milestone this fall in Connecticut when we modernized gaming by enabling sports wagering and online gaming in our state. I am pleased to say that the governor Lamont placed the first official wager on September 30th, Mohegan Sun. Through our partnership with FanDuel, we opened the temporary sportsbook retail location featuring four live betting windows and nearly 50 self-service betting terminals. The permanent 11,000 square foot Mohegan Sun FanDuel Sportsbook will open later this winter. By modernizing our gaming industry through the legalization of sports wagering and online gaming under the framework of our exclusivity agreements, it is our hope that Connecticut will keep pace with our neighboring states and generate much needed tax revenue that will benefit almost every town in the state. As you well know, the Mohegan tribe are longtime steadfast partners with the state of Connecticut. It is a relationship based on mutual respect and communication that dates back centuries. Never has the importance of these relationships been more significant than over the past 18 months as we've collectively managed the pandemic, reopened the casinos, worked to ensure the, safe, the safety and well-being of our staff, guests, and neighbors in order to remain a key economic driver to the re regional economy and a major contributor to the state budget. Last year, we made our position clear that recovering from the pandemic meant we could not sit on the sidelines as our neighboring states took action to modernize their legal gaming laws. Today, through our collective action, we have already seen three months of revenue generated that could be spent on critical programs, services, and projects across the state. The monthly reporting shared by the Department of Consumer Protection enables us all to monitor the progress of this new marketplace. You will remember that the 13.75% of gross gaming revenue for sports wagering and 18% of online gaming is shared with the state under the new law. This is in addition to the revenue sharing agreement established under the tribe's original compacts that has resulted in over $8 billion being contributed to the state budget over the last two decades. I would like to point out that our existing agreement is the highest percentage of revenue sharing of all tribal state compacts in the United States that exists today. Despite our growth as both national and international leaders in the gaming and entertainment markets, Connecticut remains our home and Mohegan Sun our flagship. Our tribe, our members, and our families are invested in Connecticut's success. We purchase goods and services from hundreds of local businesses, contribute millions to regional and local charitable organizations, serve on over 50 nonprofit boards, support the community through food and meal donations, educational grants, and support local EMS and fire support through our tribal fire department. Our commitment to our friends, our neighbors, our region, our state remains unwavering. With expanded access to gaming, we recognize our responsibility to be sensitive to our guests and our host communities to proactively address problem gambling. We take this obligation seriously and long ago created our own problem gambling committee. To this end, we have established measures that include self-exclusion lists, including a self-exclusion program that allows guests to permanently self-exclude from the property. We also have frequent and thorough employee training programs, advanced monitoring and tracking systems, 
and 24-hour counseling lines and live chat programs. Additionally, in partnership with the state, Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling, Mohegan Sun produced a problem gambling brochure, which can be found at various locations on property and digitally on our website. The brochure is available in multiple language. Problem gambling messages and helpline information is printed on most of Mohegan Sun's collateral, including but not limited to business cards, brochures, ATM receipts, posters, and all pro promotional direct mail pieces. Helpline information is available on plasma screens property wide and appears in Mohegan Sun's video, which broadcasts throughout all 1600 rooms and suites. In addition to the financial support we have, we have continued to provide to the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling for over two, get, two decades, we also work closely with the National Council on Problem Gambling. I currently serve as an advisory board member to the National Council after having served two terms on the board as the treasurer. This is personal for us, and we continue to engage partners to identify new and innovative ways in which we can combat problem gambling and support our guests. As we prepare for the upcoming legislative session, we stand ready to work with you to ensure Connecticut retains its place as a leader in gaming and entertainment world, and to ensure that we create a fun, successful, and safe experience for everyone. As Chuck pointed out, we have mem many members of our team here with us today with an incredible amount of knowledge, experience, and expertise who can serve to answer any questions you might have. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. We are grateful for your ongoing support and dedication to the tribe, to the Mohegan Sun, and the local businesses that depend on us and the thousands of employees that we consider part of our team. Thank you, Ray. Is there anybody else from the Mohegan uh, group that will be uh, making a statement? Pre no, Senator, we, we thought it was uh, your desire to um, have uh, a lot of time for Q&A, and that's why we Thank brought them all here, but we don't wanna eat up all that time. Thank you very much. So up next, uh, we'll do, um, uh, we'll have a uh, Rodney Butler, Tribal Chairman, uh, Mashantucket, next. All right. Wiki Sook, the Dupawong. Good afternoon, friends. Actually, my, my talking points is just to actually say good morning. I said Kui Kwasin, but uh, certainly uh, we're well into the afternoon now. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be before the Public Safety Committee this year, uh, reporting on the implementation of sports betting and iGaming. Uh, certainly much better. Uh, than the advocating for its passage as we had been doing for the last uh, several years now. Um, this day has been a long time coming. Uh, Senator Austin, uh, Representative Horn, Senator Champagne, Representative Howard, members of the committee, thank you for your support, advocacy, and continued partnership over this past year. Uh, it was your leadership and diligence from both sides of the aisle that put us over the finish line. Although today's informational session is focused on sports betting and internet gaming, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to reflect on the fact that we are literally two weeks away from the 30th anniversary of the opening of Foxwoods, an enterprise that was born out of the sheer desire for survival uh, and to provide opportunity and hope for my nation. It transformed the economic landscape for not only Southeastern Connecticut, but the entire state. Over the past three decades, we have had the privilege of partnering with tens of thousands of employees who helped us provide unparalleled entertainment to over 300 million visitors, generate $4.4 billion in slot payments to the state, and create nearly $40 billion of economic impact within the state of Connecticut. I can't imagine that when John Winthrop Jr., one of the founders of the Connecticut colony, settled in Namiog, uh, now known as New London, at the mouth of the Pequot River, and befriended our sachem, our great sachem, Robin Cassis Cinnamon, after the Pequot War, that they ever envisioned a partnership that would survive 376 years and materially change the shape of Connecticut's economy for generations. That brings us to today, together with Governor Lamont, uh, the incredibly talented staff in his administration and the dedicated public servants at the Department of Consumer Protection, we've moved mountains since the last session to bring theory into practice. Today, we can report that we have forged a new path forward that both modernizes our gaming economy and reinvests in our respective communities. As you have heard me say repeatedly over the years, gaming is the revenue base which allows the tribe to fund our housing initiatives, cover healthcare, advance education, and preserve our culture and history, among many other things. We are enormously proud of Foxwoods and our extended family of employees that has put our small tribal nation in Southeastern Connecticut on the international stage. Like you, we have suffered the impact of COVID it has taken a toll on our employees, our family, our infrastructure, our finances, 
And to make matters worse, it was on the heels of the most significant expansion of gaming competition from our neighboring states, as well as across the country. The passage and implementation of the modernization package was not only a bright spot during an otherwise dismal time, it was critical to the survival of our industry. From a business perspective, with our state-of-the-art filtration system and our large footprint that allows for more than ample social distancing, we're happy Foxwoods is a place where people feel safe and gathering and enjoying some much needed respite. The opening of the DraftKings Sportsbook this fall further solidified Foxwoods as a worldwide entertainment destination, a destination that not only brings more people to the resort at Mash and Tucket, but brings more people to the region overall, supporting the broader tourism and business economy. With that comes new revenue to the state, to its cities and towns, and to our tribe. In closing, I'll say that even after 30 years of success, we can't be more excited about the future of the Mash and Tucket Pequot Tribal Nation, Foxwoods, and our partnership with the state. We have an incredible foundation, a renewed vision, and our first ever Pequot CEO and Jason Guyette, whose talent and commitment to the nation is unparalleled. I promise you all that the excitement is only just beginning as we begin this new chapter in the story of our Pequot resurgence. I'd now like to introduce a few members of my team uh, who will bring you up to speed on all that's occurred since the new legislation was signed into law. Uh, as many of you met earlier, we have Anika Howard, our president and CEO of our Master Tucker Pequot Gaming uh, Interactive, uh, Brian Hayes, a tribal member and senior vice president of gaming operations at Fox Resort Casino, uh, and Chris Sapolo, the director of legal and government affairs uh, uh, at DraftKings. Also, to help with any questions, we have Jody Cummings, our MPTN general counsel, uh, Jared Bumgard, the MPTN senior legal counsel, and George Henningsen, our MPTN gaming commission chair. And if I could very, very quickly, because you know I love to indulge in history, um, as noted, uh, Chuck and O'Higgins uh, hired on a, a, an amazing advocate uh, for Indian country and a, a brilliant attorney, uh, and Larry Roberts. But the, the connection with the Oneidas of Wisconsin and Pequot go back a couple of centuries. Uh, when many of our Pequots here uh, left the, the lands of Mashantucket for better opportunities during the Brotherton Movement and actually uh, went up north through New York and ended up in Oneida, Wisconsin. So uh, great connections and great to see my brother Larry back in the region. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anika Howard, who will go into more detail. Go ahead, Ms. Howard. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Horn, and distinguished members of the Public and Safety, um, Public Safety and Security Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share what we've accomplished in just a few short months. The pandemic forced everyone to think differently and to use online channels as a way to connect and adopt, and gaming is no different. The legalization of online sports betting and online casino in Connecticut has allowed us to refocus and bring, uh, refocus on how we bring gaming experiences to players. We're proud to partner with DraftKings and we take this journey to expand gaming and innovation in Connecticut very seriously. DraftKings brand recognition and expertise allowed us to quickly implement and adhere to the regulatory framework adopted by the state. Together, we worked closely with the Department of Consumer Protection to ensure a successful soft launch and full launch of these new and exciting forms of entertainment. With DraftKings, our goal is to create an integrated and immersive experience for players. We're committed to be the best sports betting and online gaming experience in the Northeast. Uh, the player experience is extremely important to us. And it, for us, it starts with choice and convenience. We want to allow players to gamble safely and respons responsibly, and we do this in a number of ways. So um, in terms of how players can interact with our, with our product, uh, you, they can either statewide from their mobile devices or desktop devices, online reservations, on, on our reservation via our mobile device, or at Foxwoods Resort um, via the mobile device, the ticket winner, windows, or betting kiosks. In December, we launched on-reservation mobile betting and we opened the permanent DraftKings Sportsbook at Foxwoods Resort Casino. The Foxwoods Sportsbook complements our online sports betting and online casino offerings and really rounds out a holistic player and guest experience. With over 12,000 square feet, 16 betting kiosks, seven betting windows, and an additional 30 plus betting kiosks across the resort, our players have many options. The sports book has a full restaurant, 
two bars featuring an ice rail and 24 beers on tap, multiple VIP rooms, and is anchored by one of the largest LED screens in the industry at 50 by 30 feet. It's centrally located in the heart of the resort and makes it very easy for guests to explore and discover and experience the wonder of it all. This approach has proven to be very successful for us. We are happy to report that we've exceeded our initial expectations and estimates. From the initial launch in October through the end of 2021, the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation contributed $5.2 million to the state as a result of online gaming activity. That's 1.5 million um, from online sports betting and another 3.7 million from online casino. Uh, so we think a number of things helped contribute it to the success we're seeing early in the, from the, in the market overall. Launching do, during the football season and with both online sports betting and online casino contributed to strong performance out of the gate. Um, other observations point to continued growth. Uh, for example, online activity is equally spread throughout the state with interesting patterns along the border cities, indicating residents in neighboring states are crossing the border to place wagers. We're not seeing cannibalization, cannabis, excuse me, we're not seeing cannibalization of retail gaming, indicating as predicted, the market will expand and online gaming and sports bet betting customers are distinctly different than what we're seeing um, in our retail facilities. We've seen minimal impact to the launch of sports. We've seen minimal impact from the launch of sports betting in uh, New York, but we're going to continue to monitor that closely. Pot, and we're we're seeing that primarily because, uh, unlike uh, Connecticut, New York only has sports betting and not online casino. As we celebrate our early successes, we remain steadfast in the commitment to responsible gaming. We want players to have fun and and gamble responsibly. Within the DraftKings Foxwood app, a responsible gaming message just are prominently displayed and players can easily and conveniently access the player protection center from their account. This empowers players to limit, to set limits for deposits and wager amounts and establish a cool off period or self exclude from the app. We've partnered with Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming and we were very instrumental in the creation of the Responsible Play, the Connecticut Way logo and slogan. We prominently display the logo and Responsible Gaming call to action on all marketing materials and messages. We remain vigilant and committed to funding and working collaboratively with programs focused on awareness, prevention, education, and treatment. We've come a very long way in only a short period of time, and this is the beginning. We are encouraged by these early results and the enthusiasm and interest for online gaming and sports betting in Connecticut. We look forward to continuing to drive positive results and revenue for the state. So thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, do you have anybody else speaking though? Yeah, and uh, lastly to close us out, will be Ryan Hayes, our uh, Senior Vice President from Gaming Operations. Thank you, Ryan. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Austin. Thank you, uh, Representative Horn and members of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, and good afternoon. And again, thank you for the opportunity to report on the exciting developments that have occurred since our last presentation to the committee. Um, <clears throat> Anika just gave an excellent overview of all of the things that have been accomplished uh, that had to be accomplished to get us to where we are today. Uh, she, along with our partners, made an enormously and complex, uh, complex and challenging process seem easy. Uh, which is how it should look from the outside. Uh, <clears throat> but honestly, behind the scenes, it required a Herculean effort uh, from countless individuals working 24 seven throughout various holidays uh, to bring this to fruition and, and get us to where we are today. Uh, between our gaming teams, IT teams, marketing teams, hospitality teams, our construction partners, um, we estimated that it, it took about 125 new, new jobs that we created across the property uh, to open the DK location, and 50 of which we believe between Foxwoods and DK are permanent. Uh, not we believe, they are permanent. Uh, these are positions that are working in the process today. Uh, <clears throat> and those hours that it took to get us to the point that we're at today uh, proved to be very, very uh, beneficial for Connecticut, Connecticut's economy, co economy uh, jobs and taxes. 
Uh, as Anika mentioned, we contributed $5.2 million to the state since our launch in October, which put us on pace to outperform our original first year projections that were submitted to the state in 2021. Uh, and the projections that the state had of about $13.4 million uh, in, in, in taxes for the first year. Uh, so we're well above that as, a, uh, <clears throat> as we're pacing now. Uh, our original performance not only puts us closer to what we were forecasting for year five, uh, but it also puts us on pace with uh, states like Michigan uh, that, that had the strongest launches uh, and from an average spend per person basis. Um, <clears throat> It's still very early, uh, and obviously all of the other markets are more mature, uh, but still a great start for us nonetheless. Uh, our great start and initial performance have also provided more color to the running debate surrounding cannibalization of brick and mortar casinos. Uh, as Anika mentioned, and we highlighted in our prior testimony, um, uh, and looking back at some of the first adopter states like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, we're not seeing anywhere near, uh, we're not seeing any cannibalization at all at our brick and mortar facilities. Uh, with that said, our business still continues to recover from the pandemic, but we're seeing an increase in foot traffic, tr foot traffic uh, as a result of our promotional activity combined with guests feeling more comfortable and our new DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, the increases are also very evident on our slot floors as the revenue was up month over month from last year. Uh, our revenue share to the state has resulted in contributions over the last three months of $22.6 million, an increase of $4.5 million or 25% over prior year. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, those of you, and as all of you know, our new DraftKings Sportsbook is open, uh, opened in November, and the guest volumes have been much stronger there as well than we originally forecasted. Uh, we've accepted over 125,000 wagers uh, from guests coming through the facility. Uh, with many of them being placed, as I'm sure you're all aware, on uh, the NFL season and, and <clears throat> NBA and NHL as well. So it was the perfect time to launch. Uh, thank you all again for your time. And we hope all of you come to experience the new and exciting venue that we uh, now have, have here to offer. Um, and, and again, it's something that rivals every other sports book across the country. So thank you again for your time. And Senator, speaking of that sports book, uh, last we have Chris Cipolla uh, from DraftKings uh, to say a few words as well. Thank you, Chairman Butler and uh, Nika Bryan. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Horn, Chair Austin, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Cipolla. I'm the Director of Legal and Government Affairs at DraftKings. And it's a pleasure to come before you today. In collaboration with the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation, and the team at Foxwoods, we've been thrilled by the chance to enhance the gaming experience for those within Connecticut's borders. And we are pleased to lend our insight as the system moves into the next stage of maturity. First, let me say, we appreciate all of the hard work and commitment that went into making sports betting and iGaming a reality in Connecticut. Given the timetable and intensity, we should all be proud of the milestones achieved. Uh, we, in our, part, uh, in our partnership, with uh, the team at Foxwoods, uh, it have in place gaming controls that assure uh, secure and appropriate access to our gaming platform. As all the gaming operators testified during the le uh, leading up to the passage of the Gaming Act, the ability to police online activity is actually easier than it is in brick and mortar facilities. In terms of internet gaming specifically, Connecticut's market has proven to be uh, very competitive. As neighboring states enter the field, it will be incumbent on all of us to consider new ways we can improve the gaming experience for our customers. This is an ever evolving market where consumers demand the highest levels of performance from their platforms. Experienced digital players who are accustomed to speed, efficiency, and choice in utilizing online services will demand changes as the model continues to develop. Together with the rest of the parties around the table, we look forward to seizing new opportunities as they present themselves for consideration. Thank you very much again for allowing me to join you today. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, first of all, I need to apologize to Ray Pino because I thought that uh, we were doing both tribes together. I apologize to you for not seeing if there were any questions for Mahegan first. And just for clarification, uh, both DraftKings and FanDuel um, operate under the tribes, the respective tribes, master wagering license. So they're vendors for the two tribal nations, just so everybody's really aware of that. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mahegan at all? 
in particular, please ask if you have questions relative to um, uh, problem gambling or uh, anything. Ray is their uh, key person relative to that. Uh, Representative Horn, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator. And I, I add my apology there too for perhaps a not great communication about expectations for today. So thank you, Ray, for staying on with us. Um, I, I wanted to ask, because um, I know you are, you've spent a lot, done a lot of work on problem gaming. Um, and so, you know, and, and we do need to do this, the prevalence study that Senator Austin mentioned earlier. And one of the concepts is in that it is, so when, now that we've expanded digital gaming, there's a lot more data about that. Um, and I wondered if you could reflect on um, what that data shows, what your position would be on in terms of sharing that data, you know, for consumer protection purposes, um, anything that we, we can do to make, you know, you or whoever make use of that data in order to try to catch problems with problem gaming earlier in the um, arc of a problem. Representative Horn, thank you for the question. And I really appreciate that. I think um, you know, as I said in my opening comments, I've been involved with responsible gambling for a long time. Um, I've worked with the National Council as well as the Connecticut Council for a very long time. And it's something I take very personal and very dearly. Um, I'm a contributor to both of the councils and believe very deeply in their mission. I think when it comes to digital gaming, it's very early on with respect to collecting any data or only 90 days in and understanding, you know, what that data provides. I think that, you know, there's th that it, it's a good time to do a study to understand, you know, um, now that we're in the launch and then kind of setting a baseline of where that where that gets you to in a year or two from now to understand how it, how it evolves. Um, but it is early on and I'm certainly um, continue to be involved in responsible gambling to make sure that we're putting the measures in the place. None of us benefit from um, servicing people who have a problem with it. And we all benefit um, from making sure that we're addressing the problem and only serving those who are enjoying our platforms for fun and entertainment. Have you seen in your your work nationally, um, you know, uh, models that work that we should pay attention to? You know, I, th I think that, you know, when you look at nationally, you know, the rollout of sports wagering has been much more prevalent than the rollout of iGaming. It's been on more of a limited basis. Um, beyond New Jersey, most of the rollout of iGaming has been relatively recent in the last year. Um, so we're gathering more information and more data as we go through it. Um, as was pointed out uh, by DraftKings um, representative, uh, you can collect much more data online because you know exactly what's happening at all times and through every wager. So you're able to use that data and collect it and make sure that, you're, that people are, are gaming responsibly. And we should use it in that manner to understand it. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, pass the baton. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering if um, uh, Chairman Butler, if anybody from Mashantucket would like to respond to those uh, those couple of questions that um, uh, Representative Horn was asking. Yeah, I would uh, defer to Anika or Chris if they have any additional uh, comments. Uh, Anika? Yeah, I, hello, everyone. I echo um, Ray's sentiment. Uh, right now, it's early days, but there are lots of... The good thing is that we all have operators that are successfully operating in other markets and bring all of that expertise here. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can glean from other markets. And, and really now that we're up and operational, do some of that knowledge share and go and um, do that. I mean, we did that, for example, with Connecticut Council for Problem Gaming. And when we were building out the design for the, the, the responsible play the Connecticut way, we reached out to uh, the Oklahoma market that had already successfully launched a program similarly. And so I think we can continue to, to do the same thing here. Thank, thank you. Um, up next is Senator Cassano. Senator, you mm -hmm. have, can you unmute yourself, sir? There we go. There you go. Uh, just a general question. Uh, first of all, thank you for the time and the presentation. Uh, it's been quite interesting. Uh, and the whole idea of online uh, gambling has been, uh, I think, terrific so far. I think one of the drivers has been uh, football, whether college or pro football, and of course, it's pretty much over with. Is uh, Am I correct in that assumption? Are we going to have a drop off? Uh, is there that much betting on football? Uh, Ray? 
Uh, thank you, Senator. I think um, it's best if I turn this over uh, to our representatives who with FanDuel who have experience in other jurisdictions on and off football season, perhaps to address this. Thanks, Ray. Uh, hi, all. Katie Peters from FanDuel. Um, yeah, football is a huge driver for our platform, but that's not to say we don't see a lot of engagement with baseball coming up, um, the hockey season, et cetera. Uh, not as strong, but, um, you know, to echo something that was said earlier, I think Connecticut was really smart in the way they implemented this and moving quickly so that we could capture uh, users as quickly as possible in time for the NFL season. Um, so I just want to say thank you uh, for your foresight in that and um, getting this off the ground so quickly. Uh, I'll turn it over to Chris to see if DraftKings has anything else to add on that. Thanks, Katie. Um, Senator, you're correct. Football is obviously a, a tremendous uh, area of interest when it comes to, to sports betting. But as Katie mentioned, you know, we've seen another jurisdiction uh, other jurisdictions where we've launched a uh, sports betting product. There is uh, still significant engagement with the other sports. You know, basketball will go into the summer, um, hockey as well. So um, we, there, if you look historically at other jurisdictions, there may be a, a slight drop off from football season. But you know, what we're finding is that there's still strong engagement on uh, the other sports that will be taking place. And hopefully baseball uh, come the spring, fingers crossed. Um, but there's, there's a lot of engagement there. So we shouldn't see any kind of a significant drop off in revenue. Then. I think it's hard to say, you know, definitively one way or the other. It's just that, um, you know, from DraftKings perspective, we've been pleasantly surprised with the engagement, um, you know, across the board uh, in all sports. Thank you. And, and Senator, I would I would add uh, the one of the one of the many brilliant moves that the legislature made on this one was approving both uh, sports and uh, iGaming at the same time. And so to your point about the fluctuations in revenue, even if there's some seasonality in sports, gaming tends to be much more consistent. And so those will balance each other out. So we'll see a much more consistent uh, revenue stream uh, throughout uh, the state than we, what you would see in other states that just go with sports betting. Thanks very much. It's good to see you again, even if it's not in person. <laughs> you as well, Steve. Uh, thank you, Steve. Don't forget to mute yourself. Uh, yeah. Representative Howard. Thank you, Senator. Uh, two questions uh, for either either who can answer or both, perhaps both. Can we just, um, one of the representatives from the tribe, just clarify how the master wagering license works for everybody that the gaming is, is going through our tribal partners. And my second question, we had talked about the potential for an influx based on what we saw in New Jersey of folks coming to the brick and mortar establishments, you know, increasing revenue there and for the state and possibly creating additional jobs. Is, is it are you able to comment on that? I know that sort of was tandem with, with the COVID recovery, so it may not be as, as easy to see, but if you can sort of give us an idea of, of how that's starting to shape up, if it's looking like it's going to be similar to New Jersey. Well, I'll start, I'll start with the master wager licensing one because that's, that's the easy one, right? Because essentially it follows form of uh, follow suit with our exclusivity. And so, and that was, that was the major negotiating point of this going back to the prior administration was making sure that this respects and upholds the exclusivity that we have in place that's been beneficial to, to all parties. And so the master wagering, wagering license is simply an extension of that that makes sure that makes certain that all of the expansion of gaming, whether it be uh, sports, uh, uh, fantasy sports and online casino, all flow through the, the tribes and consistent with the exclusivity agreements we have in place. Ray? Uh, so, I don't think there's much more that I can uh, add to Chairman Butler. Uh, you know, obviously the operators of the digital gaming uh, digital gaming products are, are the tribes and our platform prior providers are our two partners at DraftKings and FanDuel. So um, as was contemplated by the legislation um, and in, in um, keeping with the exclusivity of the two tribes, the tribes are, are operating uh, the digital gaming products and, and uh, using the platforms of our partners that we've each um, uh, added to to our um, to our to our products. So, Ray, one of the questions that Representative Howard was asking is: Are you seeing a drop off in movement on into the brick and mortar, or are you seeing a, it stabilize, or are you seeing an increase? Um. So, it, it, 
The last 18 months has been very hard to predict on what you're seeing and not seeing. The pandemic has probably been the major driver of what you're seeing and not seeing. As you see ebbs and flows in the pandemic, you see ebbs and flows in the um, bricks and mortar um, attendance. Um, I will tell you that uh, before the Omicron variant became so prevalent, uh, we were seeing um, good returns to our brick and mortar property. And I would not say that we were seeing any impact from digital on our bricks and mortar property. And I think that was said in one of our in one of the opening statements. We think that they're um, completely um, cooperative together and they're going to work together and allows us a really digital um, a multi-factor uh, ability to engage with our guests. So I think that what we're seeing right now, and we've seen this coming up on two years now, is that attendance in brick and mortar is really dictated by the pandemic and rises and ebbs and flows in the pandemic. Yeah, well, I mean, one, one other one, yeah, one other complexity I would layer in there is similar to my opening comments where I mentioned that yes, we're dealing with COVID, but we all forget because of COVID the the significantly increased competition uh, throughout New England. And primarily being in Boston and Springfield and the impact of that, we were still digesting that expansion when we were hit with COVID. And so, you know, I think it's going to take, uh, you know, first of all, we got to get past COVID, but it's going to take another year or two after that to really see where the overall market settles in. I mean, uh, the Mass Pre Tribe and God bless them in Southeastern Mass was just uh, given uh, their land back um, in, in, in their territory over there in, in Massachusetts. And one of their goals is to, to, to build a casino as well. And so, you know, the timing of that will impact us. The expansion of gaming in Southern New York with table games coming online, it looks like they're going to expedite that, right? They just launched sports betting and the governor is talking about expediting the process for table games in, in Southern New York as well. And so, you know, again, there's multiple waves that are going to keep coming at us. So it's hard to gauge exactly the impact. Although we do know in, from what we're seeing, there's a level of stabilization and limited growth but we're still below the 2019 levels as I mean, as you can see from the slot revenues that's reported to you. Thank you both. Representative Howard, are you all set? I am and I thank them both. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. Representative Hall, followed by Representative Felipe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I missed, uh, so I got Foxwoods numbers to the state for revenue. Um, thank you, Chairman Butler, but somehow I missed uh, Mohegan's. Can whoever spoke on the numbers to the state for both the eye betting um, and the sports betting, can you repeat those numbers for me? I apologize. So, so hold on one minute. I see Rep, uh, Ray Penalt is Mohegan tribal member is getting that information off his desk. <laughs> I, I'm actually looking for, Rich, do you happen to have that readily handy? I don't see it here right now. It, it, it's roughly 3 million on the iGaming side and about one and a half million on the sports betting side. Thank you. Okay, so, and Foxwoods was the same? Yeah, we we're 1.5 for sports and 3.7 for online casino. So you're, you're both very close with the numbers. Yes. Wow. Okay. I think, you're, I think you're headed into the whole competition thing now, Representative Paul. But <laughs> just saying. <laughs> That's surprising to me. Okay. Uh, all my yeah, other questions. In, in that, in that, Representative Hall, in that sense, we're trying not to be close, but you know, well, time, will, <laughs> time will tell. It's good. It's all good. Um, all my others were answered. So thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Representative Paul. Representative Felipe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you uh, to our tribes for your presentations. Really appreciate it. Something that that stuck out to me was uh, when you were speaking about sports betting. I know there was that figure uh, talked about 125,000 wagers being placed, and I think that that's a pretty good statistic to have. But in the interest of problem gambling, are there things in place, or are there plans for the future to uh, differentiate whether or not individual uh, how many individuals made bets versus how many bets uh, how many wages were placed in the first place and also you know maybe uh, demographic breakdowns just for the uh just in the interest of problem gambling and collecting data just differentiating between 125,000 wages placed by you know 25,000 people versus 50,000 75,000 things of that or 7,500 I should say things of that nature so if we could start off with um, Ray Pino. 
Yeah, and you know, as I as I was saying early on, the ability to collect data on every wager placed, every person making that wager, um, is much more readily available in an online setting. Um, so we certainly have that information available. We can collect that information. Um, and we're certainly looking into that information with our partners with FanDuel on looking for indices of problem gambling and making sure that we address it. So yes, the data is readily, readily available. We collect it and, you know, we'll certainly be utilizing it. And, and that, that goes for, you know, the, the sports book people who are placing wagers in the facilities as well, because that's really more of what I was uh, speaking to. So, you know, with the advent of, um, with kiosks, um, you know, e even then you have to have money account wagers to be able to place wagers. You can technically go up to a window um, and place a wager and be more anonymous and place it on a kiosk. Um, but as we've seen in every other jurisdiction that we operate, when you have online wagering and retail sport wagering, you're going to find that 85 plus and in many jurisdictions, over 90% of wages are actually made by mobile. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Butler. Anything from Master No, Dr. I think, I think I mean, Ray absolutely answered it uh, perfectly. I don't know if Anika, if you had anything else to add to that. Uh, the only thing I would add is that there are some additional things that we can do and we have done in kiosks. For example, you can limit the, the, the um, amount of the bet that can be placed in kiosk and other things that you can do. And, and, but to Ray's point, a lot of that is tracked very specifically and similar to what Ray and FanDuel are doing, we're doing the same thing on the DraftKings side to maybe to anonymize that data and making sure that we're not seeing any concerning patterns emerge. Thank you, I appreciate the answer. And rep Representative, the, the one other thing that I would add is I think all of you should give yourselves a pat on the back. When you look at it from a, from a problem gaming perspective, responsible gaming perspective, I mean, the, the Connecticut legislature did go above and beyond and not always to, you know, to our, our agreement, uh, but you did the right thing in a sense of making it very tight and, and, and focused on problem gaming and the, the awareness and all, the, all the, the steps that you've required us and our operators to have in place uh, online uh, has been very beneficial for those that, that do have that challenge and need that help. And so again, uh, that's a reflection of your, your efforts. So thank you for that. All set, Representative Felipe? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative Warren for the second time. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I had a question about, um, a lot of conversation has come up about um, how that, I know that both tribes have voluntarily contributed to uh, problem gaming initiatives for many, many years. Um, some of that language and those requirements changed in the, the um, law that we passed last year. And, um, and I wonder whether you could each talk a little bit about how you are directing those funds and and maybe like the timing of those funds and if there are any issues that you see uh, there. Yeah, uh, if I if I I'll give some background on just how we got there. Uh, to your point, uh, Madam Chair, you noted that they were voluntary uh, up until this year, and you know both tribes felt you know a, a sincere commitment to problem gaming, and it's and it's something that we that we are passionate about. Um, in the negotiations with the governor and and, and David Lehman and the like. Um, we this came up as as making it something more permanent, right? And and we said, look, we've been doing it voluntarily for years. We've been consistent with it. But if if you need it uh, permanently, um, then we're okay with that um, because it's the right thing to do, and we're going to continue to do. It. And so credit to the governor and his staff to to make sure that's locked in, uh, you know, without question, uh, and not only locking it in but increasing as well because we looked at what the averages had been from a voluntary perspective, and we were both given about three hundred thousand a year plus or minus. Um, for the last 30 years in our, in our part. Um, and so we felt like with the expansion, although it's not similar to the scale of our retail facilities, the online gaming is going to bump the market, you know, some percentage, but, but nowhere near what we're already seeing uh, both at Foxes and Mohegan. And so we felt like an increased contribution was important, um, but the flexibility to make sure that it's not only going to um, the Connecticut Council and Problem Gaming, which we've committed to continue uh, at our prior funding levels, but also at other um, uh, initiatives throughout the state that focus on problem gaming. And in our case, it's talking to some of the universities and some of the other agencies um, that, uh, that that focus on this and that can help. Um, and, it, it, and again, on top of just the, um, you know, the, the regular advertising that we do for C Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming on our websites and on our billboards and everything else. And so, um, I mean, there's a lot of in-kind 
uh, contributions that are going on just from a marketing perspective. And clearly it's, it's working because people are aware of the Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming and they are seeing the, the uptick in calls. Um, but, you know, we felt like that was important to lock that in and, and we were okay with that. As far as the legislation goes, it also uh, ties into the state's fiscal year. And so, um, and, and this year it was nuanced, right? Because it's, it's, it's prorated based on the start of online gaming. And so um, technically this year, the amount's closer to about 350,000 that's required uh, to do by the end of the state's fiscal year in, in June. And so we've, we've, committed, we've committed to that. Um, and we've already started to process those payments, or at least for the uh, Connecticut uh, Council, in line with what we've given them previously. Uh, and again, as I noted, we're looking at other organizations in the state to, to make those contributions. But again, that's, there's no question that we'll make those contributions before the end of the fiscal calendar every single year. So, I would, so just, I would just add if, on if, we could wait, if we could wait one minute for everybody that I want to get Mahegan into before yeah, you I ask the question, Maria. Yeah, can I just, um, yeah, so on, on, again, having been in the room during those negotiations, um, to piggyback on what the, what Chairman Butler said, Mohegan actually has been outside of the Connecticut Council, has made a lot of other contributions um, in state and out of state where we do business, you know, in, in other jurisdictions and are contributing both the National Council and to other surrounding states. But we just never had to disclose that. It was volunta voluntary. So what you're going to find out is, frankly, we could we'll put some dates on it so you can see that some of these contributions in the in the tens of thousands a year above the Connecticut Council, we've been doing for two decades. Um, so it was frankly just, and we didn't, it's not something we publicized or had press conferences over because um, it was just what the tribal council told us to do and they wanted to do and it wasn't about publicity, it's about doing the right thing. So you're gonna see that we've had long-standing relationships with other folks that we just didn't publicize because we didn't have to. Uh, Representative Horn. So, yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, just for clarity here, I mean, part of the issue here is when you say problem gambling, it, it um, or get, you know, there's a, an array of, there's the prevention side, there's the, you know, the, the um, public, you know, publicity side, there's the treatment and rehabilitation part, and um, some of those things are on a continuum, and, and I know that, you um, that you're, I, I, I'm aware that both tribes are thinking about all of that array of issues. And, and have you, I mean, do you have thoughts on how to balance how much of those contributions go to which end of that or what an appropriate balance ought to look like from your perspective, what works? Well, I think for us, for Pequot, the, the lion's share obviously is going to the to the council, right? Because um, that's where we've been putting it um, and we'll be consistent with that. But I think as noted throughout this conversation, this is this is a new market, right? And so there, you know, there's new behaviors uh, that need to be identified, and we'll, we we intend on working with the council, working with Demas, working with the legislature, and trying to identify those new areas that have come up because of it being online gaming and, on, and online sports, uh, and then direct the dollars appropriately towards those issues. Yeah, yeah, I would I would I would say that you know we haven't quite figured out the formula, but it's the Mohegan intention to. To continue to exceed the the floor established during negotiations, um, and expand on some existing relationships that we think um, are really exciting, and will uh, will make a difference here in Connecticut and beyond. And so we're excited to roll those details out as as we formalize them. Uh, it, we're not we're not ready today, but uh, we are we're very excited. Ray is personally directly involved in those things, as he said. Ray's Ray's commitment um again is not just financial but his own time and his own personal finances ray is really leading this and so in the next in the next weeks we'll 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 have some more color to what we're we're looking at thank you thank you both for your commitment to this part of the issue which is is heartening thanks thanks senator and so i do i just want to point out there is a third partner in all of this that um uh, gives no money directly, just does indirect contributions, and that would be the lottery. So we need to talk with the lottery also on this issue uh, to make sure that everybody understands that all the partners need to be a part of this, not just not just two. Um, so uh, right. thank you. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, Chuck. Go ahead. No, no, no. I just I wanted to apologize when. Um... When we agreed to the forum, we thought, and again, I know there's some technical issues. 
we were under the understanding that we, we were on for like the first 30 minutes. And I know that some of our team, uh, because the council did ask us to bring everybody and, and have them available. I know that we had some folks that have other commitments because uh, yep. we, again, we thought it was, we were presenting. I'm and then, sorry. That you know, was oh, my no, fault. No, I understand. Look, we're all, we're all friends and real friends and you guys have fought and bled for us. And so we want, we want to make ourselves available, but I do know I'm getting some text messages from people that say um, they have to go. <laughs> unfortunately, they're trying to be very polite and they, <laughs> I just know that they're, we're under some, some pressure. Yep. On us. Yeah. So I understand that. So th thank you both very much. Um, uh, if you want to leave a member or so on that can answer questions, uh, go ahead. If you can't, that's also fine. Um, does anybody you, have Ed, uh, Al Paolello? I'm sorry, Representative Paolello. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and for uh, both chairs for putting this together together today and for our partners to be here. Uh, I won't keep folks, but uh, Brian Hayes brought up a, a point around uh, job creation uh, with online uh, sports betting and and with the advent and uh, putting this together over the last five or six months. And I wanted to uh, kind of just follow up on uh, what the numbers look like for the creation uh, with online iGaming and also with sports betting, uh, what those job numbers look like and overall uh, for both of our tribal partners, uh, what the overview, uh, what the jobs picture is and uh, just kind of touch there to begin with. Chuck? Uh, I don't I'll turn that over to us. Sorry, Ray. I was muted. I, I okay. think that's Go ahead, Ray. by Ray. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, and, and it's a senator. Thank you for the question. I really appreciate it. I will tell you that uh, it's still early on. I can tell you that we've added um, several jobs to the organization. Um, it is a separate division under Rich Roberts as the president. We're building it out now. I will tell you, we continue to be challenged with finding people for all the jobs that we want to fill, um, but we're building out the organization now. Um, and as we continue to grow and expand and, and, um, and implement our digital strategy, our, our, um, our, our total employee base in the digital um, division will continue to grow. And um, you know, if we could fill all the positions that we've had, we'd, we'd be into, um, into this. There'd be several individuals that would be hired that we, we have several open positions that we're just able to hire. We're posting them. We continue to post them and continue to look for them. And I'm confident that we'll add uh, several dozen jobs just in Connecticut alone to help run this, run this small part of the division. It'll continue to grow. Rodney? Yeah, again, Brian Touchstone, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Brian. Um, but as he noted, we had the, the number of jobs that we did hire, we still have opening. I mean, the, the labor market in Connecticut is so tight and so difficult. Um, in addition to our sports bar, we still have hundreds of openings uh, throughout uh, the entire enterprise. So, uh, Brian? Yeah, so uh, Representative Payalolo. So, yes, I was referencing the, the retail sports book and sports bar on property. Um, and, and we do have 50 positions that we filled. So that's between all the individuals that are working at the sports book and then everyone that's working on the food and beverage side. Uh, and to Chairman Butler's um, point, we actually still have open positions. We were shifting people around to just fill the spots that we do have. Uh, so that's just the beginning. And, and um, Chairman Anika, I guess you can reference the, the online portion uh, and what that looks like from the staffing perspective. And so not to interrupt, I just want to clarify when I said seven dozen people are going to hire that's just in the digital division, as you know, I did not include the retail on premise sports book, um, which will be hiring um, many more than that, um, but we'll be opening our sports book this winter. Go ahead, Anika. Thank you. Similar to Mohegan, we are spinning off a separate division. And so we are starting to staff up for that as well. We don't have the final numbers of what the full organization is going to look like, but we do have a handful of positions that are open and posted as we speak. So uh, similar, we, we anticipate as this grows and as we expand that uh, that footprint will expand as well. Representative Paolello. Madam Chair, if I could just uh, follow up and ask uh, both of our tribal partners, just organiz organizationally wide uh, with employee counts today, uh, maybe comparing them to pre-pandemic, if I can just follow up uh, with that question, since uh, obviously we want to be supportive and, and, and are thankful uh, for the jobs and, and for uh, the opportunities that are created. So if I can 
just kind of ask that question uh, to see where we are with employee counts today, organizationally. Well, again. Yeah. I would say it's it, if, if you wanted to look at a case by case basis and take a snapshot in time, are we at March of 2019? We're not. But are we at more open jobs right now than we are in 2019? 100 percent we are. Um, we continue to struggle with filling positions. And as was already stated, we're moving people around and people are taking on second jobs and working additional hours. We also don't want to stress out our team. So many of our restaurants and other amenities aren't open for the full complement of hours. That's not for a lack of wanting to in many circumstances. It's for a lack of um, having team members to do it. So on a case-by-case -case basis, if you want to compare pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, we have many more jobs open now and available for team members than we had back then. And, and you know, we're looking to fill those positions and expand the, the non-gaming offerings and, and other amenities here at the property to offer fuller services to our guests. Uh, yeah, we're, we're in similar similar uh, form, but I'll, I'll defer to Brian to give the specific details. <clears throat> so yes, uh, um, as as Ray mentioned, we're in the same exact situation. We we have more positions open than we did pre-pandemic. We are not back to pre-pandemic levels, and we don't have uh, every portion of the facility open all week long. Uh, so we're actually still flexing into different parts or portions of the property on weekends versus weekdays, and we keep them closed on weekdays uh, based on volumes and based on staffing. So we're in the same exact situation, and we are not. Um, we're, we are also not at pre-pandemic staffing levels. And Senator, just to add to that, and I think Brian would agree. It's is we improving, not as much as we. <laughs> Like, but it's getting better. Um, there were times um, previously where, where, where it was much worse and things actually had to remain closed entirely because there just wasn't staffing for it. I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel that it seems to be getting better and improving more applicants um, and therefore more offers made and more team members coming on. But I wouldn't say that we're there yet. Yeah, absolutely. Rep Yes, Madam Chair, if I could follow up on uh, one other line of questioning uh, that came up maybe 15 or 20 minutes ago around uh, wagers uh, made and kind of breaking it down, if I can ask the question this way uh, to both of our tribal partners around the wager, line, uh, what does that represent for new accounts, both with sports wagering and also new accounts being established for ICing? I think I missed a critical part of that question. I apologize. You think uh, the acquisition of new of new folks, Ray? New signups, people that we ha that are outside of our database. I think that's what I heard. Is that, that what is you want? Go ahead, Ray. Uh, Richard, I, I would have to tell you that right now that we have to do a matching of the databases to ensure that. Um, I can't give you an exact number right now. We, we continue to explore that. Um, the, the ability to sign up for the card and, and cross-pollinate the two and, and exactly match the two is not perfected yet. That is something I will tell you that we're in the process of working on. And in the next 90 days, we could have a more definitive answer for you. But sitting here today, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Brian? Yeah, so we're in the same situation, and Anika can probably provide a little bit more light. But I, I, from my perspective, I know we haven't done that that true crossover between databases on digital and, and land based. Uh, but Anika may have more information on the actual signups themselves. Anika, uh, Allison and Austin. No, we don't. We're in the same situation, and I think the first part of this was really around getting the operations up and running. And now a lot of the work is focused on kind of that data, data matching and having a little bit more of a deep dive on the player experience. Um, for us, we know that, for example, we have the option for players when they register to say whether they want to opt in to Foxwoods Rewards, but to Brian's point and to uh, the gentleman at Mohegan, we still have not done that direct ma mapping. Um, that's on the roadmap for the next 90 days as well. Katie or Rich, do you have some examples from other states, what they've seen that might be helpful? And then Representative Polillo, we'll get back to you as we as we get the data. Um, we know where to find you and we'll make sure you have it. But Absolutely. Is there Thank stuff from know. other states that might be helpful for what, what, our, what our goal would be? Uh, Chuck, you know, if we look back at New Jersey, we're definitely, uh, you know, where, where I was before was roughly about 30%. 
of the database over a few year period of time um, joined joined the iGaming site. You're not going to hit maturity. I heard this today, so I won't pretend it's something I, I, I knew. Uh, that you're looking at like, I think it's 2026 for full maturity in the state. That's what I heard from Katie earlier. So yeah. I'll steal that from her. Please do. Representative Taylor. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the answers today. I really appreciate it. Hey, if you have anybody looking for a job, we'll have them move up to Eastern Connecticut. We'd be okay with that. We have a lot of openings. <laughs> thank you, Senator. A lot of openings. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you. We're going to, um, uh, those of you who could stay on, please stay on. Uh, we're going to go to the lottery right now. Um, and uh, we have um, Rush Street for the lottery. I, I don't know if anybody else from the lottery is here today. Yes, Senator. I'm uh, Greg Smith, president of the lottery, and I'll, I'll introduce a few people that have joined us in the call from lottery and also from Rush Street. And if I could just say that Rush Street is your is working off of your uh, master license. Yes, yeah, so we're one of the master licensees, uh, like the tribes, and our operator Rush Street would be the business partner equivalent of FanDuel and DraftKings for the tribal operators. And Sports Tech is uh, um, also operating off of your master licensing. Is are they working directly <clears throat> with Rush Street, or are they work, working directly with you? They work with us, uh, and right now uh, they have um, nine retail locations that they had been in prior to this expansion that we have uh, stood up sports betting retail operations uh, in so far, uh, but they are licensed under us as uh, sports betting retailers. Thank you very much. If you want to go ahead and introduce your team, please do so. Thank you. I'll do that in a, a couple of uh, a minute or two of opening comments, and then we'll be ready for some questions. So, uh, good afternoon, co-chairs Horn and Austin, uh, Vice Chair Paylillo, Ranking Members Champagne and Howard, and other distinguished members of the Public Safety and Security Committee. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, my name is Greg Smith. I'm president of the Connecticut Lottery Corporation. Thanks for inviting us to participate in this forum. With me to assist are Andrew Walter, our Director of Legal and Business Affairs for Sports Betting. Chris Davis is a CLC Manager of Government Relations and Responsible Gaming. And we are joined by Laura Cox, Josh Ford, and Tammy Barlow from our sports betting partner, Rush Street Interactive, uh, which is based in Chicago. To begin with, it's always of primary importance that I inform you about traditional lottery. Uh, we finished uh, FY21 with 200 million in sales growth, which led to an almost 420 million general fund contribution. Uh, that was up $70 million from the prior year. Remarkable numbers, just another great year. I'm proud to report that current year-to-date sales are on the same pace as for fiscal 21, and we are just a few million short of last year in our year-to-date transfers, uh, so lottery is just having a great year again. Uh, last session, CLC was authorized to begin sports betting through both online and retail channels, uh, also online lottery and Kino, and to offer fantasy contests. The CLC board and staff were honored by this, and we appreciate the confidence and trust placed in us by allowing us these expansions. We launched online sports betting along with the other operators in mid-October and started our initial retail locations just a few weeks later at the existing Sportech locations. This was no small feat recognizing we selected Rush Street Interactive in July and signed an agreement in August. Starting a business is hard and starting a highly regulated business in such a tight time frame is even harder. We appreciated the hard work and difficult tasks that Commissioner Siegel and the Department of Consumer Protections perform to get all three operators to the starting line and improve our operations. These are mostly behind the scenes efforts that seldom get attention, but are clearly due recognition. I think it's safe to say that most of you never heard of PlaySugarHouse.com before this fall. And I can confidently say now that we have gained good market awareness since launch. We've had a successful first three months and are seeing good signs of that continuing. You are likely more aware of the brands that we're competing against and may have even seen an ad or two um, on the air recently. CLC's plan is the long game, and we expect that our awareness, market share, and returns to the state will further strengthen your confidence in us. 
Now that sports betting is live, iLottery is coming next, likely this summer, followed by fantasy contests, ideally by the end of 22. I'll close by saying that CLC continues to work closely with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming in our responsible gaming efforts for retail lottery and for our new endeavors. We continue to fund this with our $3.3 million annual contributions and additionally with our marketing work to get the message out for staying in control with gaming and calling for help if you need assistance controlling your participation. CLC has been a leader of responsible gaming and lottery for a few decades and we expect to uh, remain a leader uh, going forward. So thank you for the time to make those remarks and we are ready for any questions that you might have. And first of all, we want, I, I, I want to, I don't, uh, I'm certain all my colleagues do want to say hi to Chris Davis and welcome him back to a legislative meeting. Um, we miss him. And, thank you, uh, Senator. <laughs> it's nice to see you. It's always um, a pleasure to be back with the Public Safety Committee. <laughs> That's what people tell me. You know, I, I, I'm going to take it as fact. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a, a couple questions, Greg. Um, we've talked before about the um, uh, contributions um, from the lottery relative to problem gaming. Um, and my understanding is a lot of it's indirect, relatively speaking. Um, can you can you go through what that is uh, so that we understand that? Yeah, uh, let me start and I'll see if Chris has any uh, add-ons for it. But so uh, statutorily, the lottery operation, the retail lottery that we've been doing for yep. 50 years, uh, gives $2.3 million each year uh, to DEMAS, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Yep. Um, they take that money and they distribute in a variety of ways, either services or to other organizations but so that's 2.3 that we bring in annually uh, to that. And then the, the expanded gaming uh, asked us to bring in another 1 million on top of that each year. Uh, same process, turning it over to Demas. So that total contribution of 3.3 million. And then we also, and I, and I, I heard the tribe say it, and, I, and I'm pretty much aware of it as well. I think we all do some additional marketing uh, in-kind benefit for getting the message out there about if you need help, do this, and also how to stay in control. And so those are the additional non-declared uh, uh, financial efforts that we bring forward to help pay for the marketing services, message creation, uh, and execution of that. And uh, I don't know if Chris had anything more to add to that, but that's the surface level view. And, and if, before you go to Chris, I, if I could just sort of dive into that uh, Demas contribution. Mm -hmm. Con relatively speaking, um, uh, do you know if any of the Demas contributions go to CC, uh, uh, the Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming, or does most of it go to programming at the, um, at the uh, RACs, the Regional Addiction Councils, uh, do you know? You don't know, it's fine. Uh, I, I think we do. And I, if, uh, I'm going to give Chris a first shot at that. And if not, I can tell you what I am aware of for. Yeah. So under the state statute for that chronic gamblers fund, um, no less than 5% of that is required to go to the council on problem gambling, okay. uh, presumably to help fund the, the helpline services that they provide. Um, and then uh, another percentage of it goes directly to that treatment. So a vast majority of the treatment done through the state is funded or almost entirely funded through that chronic gamblers fund that's funded by the Connecticut Lottery Corporation. So then it would be safe to say that there was an increase in the dollar amount because while the 5% stayed the same, the amount was larger. So it's 5% of the larger amount. Would that be fair to say? That, that is accurate. And... Uh... I have been told, but would need to look into it to provide a better answer back. But I've been advised that uh, I think 15% of our total contributions, uh, either initially or, or now with the larger amount, uh, are provided to um, CCPG through Demas. But that's not our transaction. We give it to Demas and then they take it uh, through the other requirements that they have. So then we can ask Demas to provide us with a breakdown of where those dollars go. Yes. They should be able to provide that. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Representative Horn. 
Thank you, Senator, uh, who just asked my first question, but um, I wonder whether um, you could you referred to your uh, as did the tribes a little bit, but uh, your other marketing work, the sort of in kind work you do on this front, and I wonder how if you could describe that with a little bit more detail about how you decide what to do and whether you look at its effectiveness. Um, just take me through that a little bit. You want me to comment on that, Greg? I can jump. Go, in. go ahead, and I'll and I'll add color commentary if I uh, hear any more. Yeah, so, so for the last couple of decades, actually, we've worked very closely in uh, what we refer to as the partnership with the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and, and uh, meet monthly with them and, and quarterly with actually the group with the tribes as well um, and Sport Tech. Um, and recently they launched the Responsible Play of the CT Way um, ad campaign. Um, that we've helped fund and provide uh, additional advertising for. So for instance, within our loops on the digital billboards, we have included in there the problem gambling helpline uh, billboards that are part of the spend that we make to purchase those billboards and we include them in there. Um, over the last year, we also produced a radio ad that is specifically just for the problem gambling helpline that's provided by CCPG, something that we paid for and produced uh, in partnership with them and, and pay for its uh, um, airing onto the television or onto the radio. Uh, and we also have separate uh, problem gambling helpline um, uh, television ads as well. So um, coupled all those things together with the out of home on the billboards, the radio and television um, it adds up to a, a significant amount of spend uh, in addition to the $3.3 million that we give to DEMAS each year. And if I can add to that, I, I've, I've been made aware that we, uh, this marketing in-kind effort uh, uh, is valued at over half a million dollars a year. And that if you, you should look at it as we, we talk with them about what's the message we want to put out, whether it's about uh, if you're in trouble, call, <laughs> or if you want to stay out of trouble, here's how to, how, here's how to game responsibly. And so we bring forward both of those, but it is our purchase of the media that allows it to be broadcast, whether it's a billboard, whether it's radio, whether it's television or any of the efforts digitally. And have any of these methods of broadcast shifted in, in light of the, you know, shift to, you know, online um, uh, betting? We, we continue to do these uh, in a very similar fashion. Um, in addition to anywhere somebody goes for this online expansion, so for us, sports betting, and then soon I lottery, everywhere you go, the responsible gaming message is there in front of you. So when you enter the mobile or, or a, a online platform, uh, when you're logging into your account, when you've been on it for the required minutes, um, anytime you pass certain dollar spend thresholds, the messaging is put in front of you by requirement. And so it's constantly available to you. And, and you know, one of the things that's really, uh, it's challenging, we, we like to be able to say that we pay for these services to be, be provided. None of us want the money of somebody who's gambling in a problem or frantic situation. We want the person to call for help. And so it's getting that message out there and then knowing that the services are there when they do it, you just hope somebody doesn't wait too long. That's what we're all hopeful for is that the services are used. And, that, and that's what we rely on the person uh, to do is to step forward and, and ask for the assistance. Representative Horn. That was what I hope, thank you. Thanks, Senator. Um, so I have, one, I have another question for you, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, uh, uh, to your knowledge, were people betting on sports before we had legalized sports betting? Uh, not to my direct personal knowledge, uh, but I'm going to say uh, I was aware that there was a, a, a black market for it. Let's put it that way. So, so that at least now we have an ability to track what people are doing. That, that's been one of the values of, of saying, bring it into the sunlight. And it's, you know, you heard the, the, the tribal partners and their operators before talking about we've all been collecting data, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Laura uh, or Tammy from Rush Street to add on to this, but the, the data collection from the play that we have now will allow us to cut up and see what are the signals that we're seeing, and, oh. and not only just in Connecticut, but maybe in some of the other places that are operating. So yes, we like the ability to see this, and, and then it's, is anything wrong? What can we do about it? 
and and what are the baselines for saying there's a problem now or there's not a problem yet. So, Laura, why don't I pass it over to you um, if you want to add to that? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Greg, and and thank you for that question, uh, Chair Austin. Um, I, I want to introduce. Um, Along with me, um, my teammate, Tammy Barlow, who's our director of corporate social responsibility, who uh, just joined us in August and has given us a really fresh perspective on how we are approaching um, response to problem gambling, not just in, in Connecticut, uh, where we are very proud to be uh, included in the operations, um, but also in the other 12 jurisdictions in, in the U.S. That, in which we operate online. Um, and uh, Tammy's been working very closely with Chris Davis um, on our, our efforts uh, in Connecticut. So Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you to um, give some explanation on the type of data that we're seeing and how we're utilizing it. Thank you. Um, very nice to be here. And I will say that, you know, I think the greatest thing um, that our partnership shows is that, you know, when you work together, um, you really do help people more because you've got more people coming together about their side of the protection. And so I appreciate our relationship with the lottery. I talk to Chris just about every week. Um, we do offer protections on our mobile app. We offer limit setting tools, cool offs. We do offer, you know, uh, our players a chance to exclude if they'd like to for one or five years. And then if they need longer, they can go to the DCP. Um, um, we are very, very um, big on training. We designed a training specifically for the state of Connecticut to make sure that, you know, it met the needs of, you know, Diana Good from the, you know, council perspective, because we understand that there are very varying uh, stakeholders um, in this area. So um, we try to offer you know, everything and we monitor it to look for everything from a you know, are, you know, are, are we looking at levels of harm, you know, um, how is our customer service team, you know, um, reacting to different calls, um, what are the resources that we have, you know, we um, have a brochure from the council that we send out to our uh, people who are at risk um, in the state of Connecticut. So that was provided to us by Diana Good, which was great. I know that they also have a QR code. And so we're trying to stay on top of the different ways that we can be a, the, the best partner and and working with uh, Chris who I'm going to turn it over to he can tell you more about you know their end of how we how we work as partners yeah to give you another example of um, kind of being proactive in this space uh, even tomorrow uh, we're meeting with Demis um, and their service providers through the better choice program and Tammy and I and, and some of Tammy's team will be explaining to them and giving them a demonstration on how to utilize the responsible gambling tools that are present within um, the Play Sugar House app. Um, so they'll be able to work with their clients that maybe aren't quite ready for that self exclusion and that permanent removal from uh, gambling, but instead, you know, made aware of the deposit limits, the time limits, the spending limits, um, and the other features that we have in the Play Sugar House app. Um, so we're, we've been working very closely with both Demis and CCPG since the beginning of the launch and, and really trying to, uh, to work with them in a true partnership to, to make sure that we're reaching those people that need the help. Thank you, Chris. Um, and and I, I see Representative uh, G. DG has uh, a question, um, but before I go to him, um, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, I just wanted to say that not all the dollars are going into um, the state coffers relative to the gaming accounts that we have. Um, is, is it not true that once I lottery is up that that money is going to debt-free college? Uh I am not aware that our contribution uh, destination has changed. Um, uh, the, the money for iLottery was not directly designated to fund uh, college tuitions that I'm aware of, uh, that we're still contributing into where current retail lottery goes and that the legislature will make that decision of how it's, how it's used. I think we already made that decision. So I think that you might wanna check in the implementer that happened, but. Thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, we, uh, Senator, just on that note, yes. Um, so yeah, that money will be um, segregated um, to be put into a, in, into that account uh, once iLottery does get up and running. Um, it, we do recognize that it was included in the budget. Thank you. Uh, Representative DG. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator brought up a good point. I, I, I reminded me to ask you, is there any desire by the state to go after these um, these offshore gaming accounts that are uh, that are running, uh, you know, uh, they're running and they're obviously uh, dipping into your, our, our pot as a state um, with no safeguards, you know, for problem gambling, with no safeguards to watch over uh, who is gambling. Is there any interest at all in, in, in chasing after these uh, offshore accounts? Is that question being posed to uh, Connecticut Lottery? Yeah, yeah, I, I would assume you guys, right? I just as a, as a state, as an organization, is there any uh, interest in uh, going after them? Um, I'm gonna say from our end that our task is to stand up the sports betting piece and operate within the, the legal and regulatory framework. If, if we are asked to pursue that, uh, it will be at cost. And I would want the, the legislature to be aware of that because those, those dollars aren't just for us to decide how to spend. And so um, I think there's potentially some benefit, but it might be early on because we're still in the customer acquisition and growth stage and would like to believe that uh, the customers making the choice to come and operate uh, in the regulated, regulated and legal market uh, will be ultimately in their benefit. Um, and then if we think that that exists uh, in future years and that it's worthwhile, that that takes consideration. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I to, to her point, yeah, there's... <laughs> There's uh there was gambling before and there's still gambling now that are you know obviously uh, uh skirting the system but oh that's fine thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Representative Patalolo. Uh, thank you, Senator. Again, uh, thank you to the lottery for their testimony today. Uh, just to follow up a question from the testimony: How many retail sites uh, right now do you have uh, up and running? Uh, Representative, I can answer that one. We have nine currently. We started three in October and then six in November for a current total of nine and are looking for partners to round out the remaining. Uh, so how many are remaining? Uh, according to six. Okay. And what locations do you have now that are uh, functional? and uh, offering the opportunity to play sports wagers. Yep, so um, the Sports Haven in New Haven, where I know you've been, uh, the Bobby V's in Windsor Locks and Stamford, and then Manchester, Hartford, New Britain, Waterbury, Torrington, and Milford. And again, these are all sport tech locations at this point. Okay, and we're looking at a timeline for the, the next six to be cited and up in operations by about when? Um, in, in the coming months, um, comfortably, I would say we, we would like to have all 15 up by the end of the calendar year. Certainly some will take longer than others. Some are going to be, um, more drag and drop sort of like sport tech was not to minimize the tremendous work that went into it. And some are going to be a little bit more work, but we're, uh, fully turning our attention to this now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that information. All set, Representative. Uh, what, one other uh, question, uh, different topic. Um, we, we've talked about with our tribal partners the, the amount of wagers uh, placed on uh, online sports betting or online sports betting as this has been unveiled uh, for the last several months now. Uh, I wanted to get the lottery's, lottery's experience. Um, how many wagers uh, have been placed online? And um, if you have the information, be very interested on how many users uh, place those wagers over your first quarter uh, in business here? I think the, um, uh, we're, I, I know I don't have those numbers jotted down in front of me for being able to declare, but we're happy to follow up and provide those back to the committee members. Um, I heard, I think uh, one of the tribal partners referred to how many wagers they'd taken in uh, retail locations. And so, um, I think I'm sure that we can uh, provide you the uh, answers to what you asked there. 
Sure, certainly. Um, and I'd be interested too in the experiences as folks are attempting to set up accounts uh, online, uh, what that experience has been and, uh, you know, what is, you know, folks coming to your online site to be able to set up an account, uh, what is actually, you know, the folks that are coming there, the traffic, and then those eventually that do set up uh, an account, uh, certainly that experience uh, from visiting, and then obviously then establishing and then placing a wager uh, would certainly be interested uh, as we're having this discussion today. Thank you. Sure, and th those are all points that we uh, discuss um, with Rush Street uh, as we look and monitor our uh, business activity. And, and that, that has been what allowed me to include in my comments that uh, we are confident in continued growth and uh, getting some good uh, partnership conversations with them. Uh, we're one thrilled to be partnered with them and the other for the uh, thoughts and guidance that they give us on this. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask the questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other further questions for the lottery right now? Keep in mind that you can always ask questions as we move along. So up, up next, we have a, and both a Representative Palillo and Representative G. Von, D. G. Von Carlo. I was really hesitant to say your name. Um, you have your hands up. Um, so uh, we have up next um, Fantasy Sports, which became actually was in statute um, well before we got this done and then was further uh, talked about in the negotiations with the two tribal nations. And right now we have FanDuel, Katie Peters and DraftKings, Chris Apola. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, fantasy sports, which is different than anything else that we have here. Um, uh, fact is, is that uh, what we have been talking about right now is an intra uh, gambling um, component, which means that it's done within the state. But fantasy sports, to my knowledge, um, are uh, inter state, so they uh, travel across the country on the same platform, is my understanding. And so I don't know if. Uh, Katie wants to go first, or Christopher wants to go first, but if you could just give us a small tutorial on what we're talking about here. Sure. Truth sure, be right. told, I don't know any of it, so I, I just gave you uh, what I have gleaned from uh, the uh, legislation and what people have said. Well, thank, thank you, Chair Austin, and uh, again, um, uh, Chair Horn, distinguished members of the committee. I'm, I'm Chris Sapol. I'm the Director of Legal and Government Affairs at DraftKings. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about Daily Fantasy Sports, uh, which is an offering that has been enjoyed by Connecticut residents uh, for years and is currently made available at DraftKings through our partnership with the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. Um, Daily Fantasy Sports are enjoyed by people across the country, as uh, Chair Austin said. Uh, including hundreds of thousands of Connecticut residents. Um, daily fantasy sports are offered on an interstate basis. So when you submit an entry into a contest um, to enter a, a, a daily fantasy sports contest, you're competing against individuals located throughout the country in the states where uh, daily fantasy sports are offered. Um, we would like to thank, uh, the, uh, first and foremost, the Department of Consumer Protection uh, for its efforts to implement regulations for the conduct of daily fantasy sports in the state of Connecticut. Um, but we do believe it is critically important that any regulatory framework that is adopted recognize uh, that daily fantasy sports is a unique offering and that the regulation should be modeled after regulatory frameworks that have been successfully implemented and protected consumers in numerous jurisdictions across the country. Uh, we do have significant concerns currently uh, with the proposed regulations as they pertain to daily fantasy sports. Um, we're concerned that it will create a regulatory environment that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to continue offering daily fantasy sports in the state of Connecticut. Um, in many ways, the proposed regulations inappropriately conflate daily fantasy sports with online sports betting and the uh, online casino offerings that we've been talking about um, to this point in the uh, discussion. Um, that's something that is not done in any other jurisdiction 
and prevents, uh, it presents both uh, significant technological and operational issues um, for us as, the, as, uh, as DraftKings. Um, we respectfully submit to this committee that in passing legislation that addressed fantasy sports, the legislature intended to protect consumers and ensure that residents of Connecticut are able to participate in the daily fantasy sports contest that they have grown to love. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have and look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Consumer Protection, this committee, and the legislature to ensure that daily fantasy sports will continue to be enjoyed by the residents of Connecticut for years to come. Thank you. Katie? Chairwoman Austin, Chairwoman Horn, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to participate in this informational forum. As Ray said earlier, I'm Katie Peter, Senior Vice President for Public Policy at FanDuel Group. As you know, FanDuel is the partner of the Mohegan Tribal Nation for offering retail, online sports betting, online casino gaming, and fantasy sports contests. We know that this committee has worked very hard over the past few years to bring sports betting and online casino gaming to Connecticut in a responsible way. And we're very pleased to have worked with you and the Office of the Governor during that process. FanDuel welcomes a comprehensive fantasy contest regulations, regulatory scheme to protect consumers, such as those in place in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Indiana. As you know, there are only two authorized fantasy con contest operators in Connecticut, both of which who operate throughout the United States and apply with very minor exceptions, the exact same consumer protections everywhere we operate. Some of these key fantasy sports protections include segregating player funds from operational funds, know your customer checks, and responsible play tools. While we appreciate the Department of Consumer Protection making efforts to distinguish fantasy sports from sports wagering and online casino regulations, we believe more can be done to maximize consumer acquisition in the fantasy arena. Fantasy is a national endeavor. Customers enjoy competing with family members, coworkers, and friends who may or may not live in the state of Connecticut. As such, it's difficult to change fantasy platforms on a state-by-state -state basis, given the nature of these platforms. Because of this, there are a number of key remaining issues, including requiring users to be logged out after 30 minutes, since users spend hours building and revising lineups for contests and expect to remain logged in. Changes to management processes, which is very different for a national platform, and the requirements for multi-factor authentication at every login, which is unnecessary and burdensome. We look forward to continuing to work with DCP, with Department of Consumer Protection and this committee to revise the regulations and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And so I, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I know that we legalized fantasy sports if there was an agreement with the two tribal nations, which obviously the two tribal nations did not have an agreement until much later. But I believe it was maybe 2016 or so that we had started this discussion on fantasy sports, recognizing that they were different than other online platforms so to speak. Do you remember when that first happened? I Either believe it, I, I, I can uh, jump in here, uh, Chair Austin. Um, I believe it predates my time at DraftKings, but I believe that the first uh, legislation that the legislature uh, uh, passed was in uh, 2017. Thank you. And, um, and um, my understanding is the biggest difference is the uh, intrastate versus interstate uh, component um, for fantasy games. So daily fantasy sports fantasy contests are, are um, games of, of skill. Um, the you know the distinguishable from sports betting, um, but in operation when you talk about um, intrastate versus interstate. Um, Th that is a significant difference uh, with how sports betting and online casino it operates. It's on an intrastate basis versus uh, daily fantasy sports being interstate. And why that's important is uh, from a technology perspective, the technology that's used for daily fantasy sports contests um, is the same technology across the country. Whereas with online sports betting and online casino, uh, we have the ability, um, given it, it is on an intrastate basis, to adapt site experiences, to address um, specific regulations that may 
take place or be adopted in a certain state. So Katie mentioned the uh, two-factor authentication process. Um, you know, with sports betting, it's much easier to implement something like that. Although, you know, we agree with our friends at FanDuel that there are uh, consumer friction points with two-factor authentication. But on the sports betting side, it, from a technology perspective, it's easier to uh, include that without impacting other jurisdictions, something that isn't the case with the daily fantasy sports offering. So, so um, um, I see my co-chair has her hand up, but I have a couple, uh, if I, I, I'll, uh, I would just um, ask for a due diligence, a little bit of leeway on this. Um, uh, so uh, were people participating in fantasy sports before the, in Connecticut, before this legislation passed? They were, and I think that's a, a critical point that you're making, Chairwoman, is that uh, the folks were successfully participating in these games. Um, a good anecdotal example is you work in Manhattan, you are in a fantasy pool with your office mates. Some may live in New Jersey, some may live in New York, but you want to be able to participate with everybody. And uh, they were doing that with, with a great deal of success prior to the legislation. And I, um, my understanding, and I worked in corrections for 21 years, and everybody I knew, except for me, was participating in some sort of fantasy game of some sort or another, um, uh, as the only gaming I ever did on, on a, a sports betting side was when I was a bartender when I was in my 20s, so that's 40 years ago, and um, I used to bet on the color of the uniform of the particular sporting team, and that's the only way I knew how to do it. My understanding is that these statistics move players around from a team they may be on where you abscond with a player from team A and team B and team C and make your own team relative to that. Is that something that, that happens relative to this type of betting? That's, that's correct. And it can be done in, uh, on a variety of uh, leagues and different different types of games. I participate in one for English Premier League. Um, NFL is very popular. Um, so there's there's a lot of different ways to do it, something kind of for everybody. Thank you. Um, Representative Horn. I was I was settling in for a longer line of questions. I, I have other questions. <laughs> I'm not asking them right now. Well, I, um, I, I, I may show my um, ignorance here of fantasy sports, having only done it like very casually in my office pools and things like that. But so I, I absolutely understand the argument that you have made both here and in, in other times we have spoken about how um, just given the nature of of the way fantasy sports work, you can't have individualized platforms in every state. Um, it just doesn't, it's not workable. I understand that. So I guess what we have to come in order to create or, you know, craft a, I, I actually think there's a, I, I'm just going to put a pin that I think there's actually a wide understanding of that. I, I Everyone that I've spoken to involved in the, even in the regulatory process seems to understand that basic notion. So then the issue is how do we craft or look at um, or select, you know, which regulatory environment a makes the most sense for Connecticut is most consistent with what we're doing on the sports betting side in which to me, in order to decide that we need to understand um, sort of with specificity, how, how a player interacts with the game. So, so I think it was Katie a minute ago who, who laid out some of the particular challenges with respect to, um, you know, having to log off after, you know, half an hour and, and the two factor authentication and, um, Having to log off after half an hour um, is those it's, those seem to me to be in tension with one another. In other words, one says you have to get off, and the other one says it's going to be hard to get back on again or cumbersome. Whereas, so are you either seeking people to stay on for longer periods, or are you, uh, you know, is it about getting on and off all the time? So explain to me a little bit about what you're trying, what you're aiming for here. I think it's both. Um, we want consumers to have easy access to their platform, to the platform in order to build and tweak their teams um, based on their schedule. Um, but we also want them to be able to stay on for an extended period of time if they have the time to devote to moving players around. As opposed to sports betting or casino, they're not 
gaming that entire time, they're building and tweaking and managing their teams. So it's just a very different environment that they're operating in. Um, and we're just trying to reduce, as, as Chris said, friction, um, trying to make it easier for the consumer um, in part so they don't go to overseas sites that have very little regulation and don't pay taxes. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, yeah Chair Horn, just, just to add a little to that, I, I think that, you know, as, as Katie was hitting on, the engagement is different. So with sports betting, with online casino, when a customer goes to those platforms, there, there is uh, wagering activity that is, is taking place while they're engaged on a repetitive basis. And it, it's a different form of engagement where you'll go on those to place a wager and then you, 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 you'll put it down and you're not looking at it. With fantasy contests, when you submit an entry fee into a contest, use football as an example, and uh, you submit that entry fee, after you submit that entry fee, there's constant adjustments of your lineup based on the budget that you have to construct the, the players that will be on your fantasy contest team. And then there's active watching of the contest playing out where the customers aren't constantly submitting an entry fee. It, it, the entry fee has been submitted to that contest, but as players accumulate statistics, they're watching in real time on our applications where they are within the contest. So it's a much more passive engagement on the daily fantasy sports application uh, when compared to the sports betting or online casino application. And that's where, as Katie mentioned, you know, the inactivity timeouts really don't apply in, in the same manner that they do for uh, the sports betting and online casino um, offerings. So would I be right from your perspective to suggest that the, that the metric to look at to protect consumers here is about sort of the amount of money wagered over a particular period of time, not, not just pure calculation of how long they're online. So with the fantasy contest, and just to, to take a step back, and I, I know responsible gaming and participation was a, a key focus of the conversations to, to this point, within our application, we do have many of the same features that you see in the online sports book and uh, online casino offering where players can uh, set uh, entry fee deposit limits and all of the things they can self exclude from uh, within the application. So many of those features are uh, present in the daily fantasy sports application uh, that you know we've been talking about with the, the sports betting application. I think that what, what where the where the difference breaks is typically in other jurisdictions how sports betting and online casino are regulated. Are, are in a manner that's very that's much more prescriptive than we see with daily fantasy sports. Whereas daily fantasy sports regulatory frameworks, when you look across the country at every jurisdiction that chooses to actively regulate daily fantasy sports, it is a more principles based approach that adopts uh, industry standard uh, specifications, and then that allows us to work with our regulator without necessarily having to fit within you know, one specific box that you may see uh, in sports betting regulations. Um, it gives more flexibility to work with the regulator to ensure a safe consumer experience, which is what we want as well. We want the safest uh, environment for our customers. Um, but you know, given the interstate nature of the offering and how it's been regulated to date, you know, that, that flexibility is, is important. And we accomplish the same goal. Uh, from our perspective and making sure that it's a safe offering. I know from our conversations, it's, you know, of the utmost important to the state of Connecticut. It is to us as well. Um, we think we can get there without, you know, having the conflation of a sports betting regulatory framework with um, a uh, daily fantasy sports framework. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. Um, Representative Howard. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you were on earlier. I apologize. I, I have limited bandwidth where I am, so I'm trying to adjust the audio. But listening to you and Katie, if I understand, it's it's not so much that the 2FA is more cumbersome in the fantasy platform as, com as compared to sports betting. It's just uh, less necessary when somebody is logging in simply to make roster moves as opposed to moving money around. Is that effectively what I'm hearing? You know, and, and thank you for the question. I, I think what I'd say is in, you know, we, we brought up the two-factor authentication, you know, as an example, because it applies to sports betting, just to, to highlight some of the functionality differences between online sports betting and daily fantasy sports. It's very hard 
um, for a, you know, speak from the DraftKings perspective to identify one or two components with the proposed regulations as they pertain to uh, daily fantasy sports and fantasy contests, because it's just such a unique uh, and distinct manner in which uh, a regulatory environment is being proposed for daily fantasy sports, and that we haven't seen all of these parameters um, put forth in the way that they are um, in any other jurisdiction. Um, you know, typically we see separate regulations for sports betting, separate regulations for daily fantasy sports. Um, and that's where the, uh, the difficulties come in for us just looking at it from a holistic perspective, um, not having the flexibility that we have in other jurisdictions to work with our regulator and, and have a, uh, a, an overall regulatory framework that's in line with that. It, it creates technological issues as well as operationally, because the operation around daily fantasy sports is completely different than the sports betting and online casino uh, verticals. So it, 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 the, the framework, um, which I believe is unintentional, just doesn't recognize how the industry operates and, and overall creates a lot of issues. Yeah. And if I could just well, jump in there, I, I think this is all very well intentioned. Um, and with any new law, there's always kinks and tweaks that need to be made throughout. And we've, we've enjoyed our working relationship with the Department of Consumer Protection and, and we're grateful for their engagement on this. So I just wanna emphasize, this is just growing pains and I think we'll get to a, a really positive place. Um, but there are some changes that I think we all agree need to be made. Okay, so I understand that part. So effectively saying that, so yeah, I think we can obviously all understand that, you know, when we regulate something there, it's gonna come with regulation. It's sort of inherent in it. And we have to, you know, as a legislature, look at that. But what you're basically telling us is the regulatory, um, or the regulations that we have in place for sports betting and online gaming may not be necessarily applicable to fantasy. And I understand that. And I, and I like to hear more about it as, as things move on and try to, to work out something that is um, conducive to that, but at the same time, doesn't put more regulation on, on one platform or to make it unfair in a competitive way, if, if you know what I'm trying to say there. But I mean, I'll say this to you. I understand the 30 minutes. That makes perfect sense to me. You're talking about fantasy. Uh, the 2FA, I'm not sure if I'm sold on on that part of it. Um, but but I, I'll, I'll like to hear more about it for sure. But thanks, guys. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Howard. Um, I, I see no other questions uh, currently for uh, you two. So just hang on. Um, uh, we have up next, we have um, uh, the uh, Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming. Uh, Diane. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Senator Austin, Representative Horn, members of the committee. Thank you for letting me participate today. Um, I'm Diana Good, the Executive Director at the Connecticut Council on Problem Gambling. And I always start by saying the Connecticut Council isn't for or against gambling. We just want to make sure that as gambling becomes easier and more accessible, that safeguards in place to protect those people who can't gamble responsibly. And right now they really aren't. Our first concern is really with the lack of funding from the casinos for prevention. We have no issues with funding towards treatment. I just want to make sure that that's really clear. The additional million dollars from the lottery has been fantastic. If you're a problem gambler, you want to be a problem gambler in Connecticut because our treatment programs here are really phenomenal. Phenomenal. That is not what our issue is right now. Our issue really is um, with prevention funding and getting people into these treatment programs. And that's really where advertising for the helpline is incredibly important. Um, during the legislative process, we were under the impression from the casinos that they were going to continue to support the council at the same level as they were doing and give an additional $500,000 towards problem gambling. And that hasn't been what has happened. They're giving a total of $500,000 and according to their legal teams, that's good enough to satisfy the requirements. Of that million dollars, an additional $64,000 total annually is coming to the council. Our calls have quadrupled to the helpline and that additional $65,000 plus the additional funding from the lottery 
is just enough money to be able to hire one additional staff person. We can't get back to pre-pandemic levels. This doesn't leave any funding to fund a training person or a prevention person. So I'm not really sure what Foxwoods is doing with their funding. Um, half of their funding is coming to the council. I don't know where the other half is going. Uh, we've also been talking to people at Yale about what they're working on, which is a computer-based treatment program called uh, CBT for CBT. And Mohegan Sun is very interested in funding that program. Our problem is the first two years of that program, they're gonna be working on developing that program. And the next three years are gonna be working on clinical trials. So they won't be seeing a patient for anywhere between three and five years. That doesn't help us when we get calls on Monday morning from people who have lost everything sports betting over the weekend. I can't really say hang in there because anywhere between three and five years from now, there could be a great program for you. It could be a great program. I don't know, but that's not gonna help the person that calls the helpline this morning. It's also not gonna help the person who lost everything yesterday who doesn't know that we have a helpline in Connecticut, doesn't know that there's treatment available. And that really gets back to our ability to market the helpline. Thanks, so Brian. again, that's what Mohegan's doing. I'm not sure about Foxwoods. Um, so our issue really is marketing the helpline. And I know that um, all of the sports betting companies, casinos, lottery have to include the helpline number in all ads, which is part of the regulations. But again, one of our issues is if you're watching television and you see a gambling ad, the helpline number is flashed for maybe two seconds on the screen. It's not enough time for you to read that number. It's probably not even enough time for you to know what that number is. Any print ad that you're getting, the font for the helpline is too small. With radio ads, the normal ad is on full volume, but as soon as they get to the helpline portion of the program, the volume is cut in half so that you can't hear that helpline. Um, also, DraftKings has kind of gotten around the advertising rule by doing a 30 minute infomercial. So it's not really an ad, it's more like a how-to sports bet. So that gets around the advertising regulations. Um, we're also concerned that they're saying that it's a risk-free prospect. All you have to do is open up an account and they'll give you $100, $500, it's risk-free. It's really not. So we're concerned about our ability to fund this great logo that we did. And now Anika was talking about the logo that we all came together to produce. It's great. I can't promote it because I just don't have the funding. We're also concerned about self-exclusion. Um, right now, the way self-exclusion is working online is when you fill out the form on the Department of Consumer Protection website, you're excluded from all gambling. So we're getting a lot of calls to our helpline from people who say that they understand how unbelievably dangerous sports betting is, but they like to be able to go to the casino a couple times a year. And so therefore they're not gonna exclude from anything because they don't like that all or nothing prospect. We think it should be a menu of options so people can decide for themselves what they wanna exclude from or not exclude from. We're also concerned, there are thousands of people on the self-exclusion lists at the casinos and they were on that self-exclusion list prior to October 7th. They're not protected from online gambling and they don't know that. So we're getting a lot of calls also to the helpline for people that thought they did the right thing. They thought they protected themselves, but they're getting all of these pop-ups. They're getting marketing ads from sports betting and online casinos. Um, they're getting emails because they are in fact not protected. So we would love to have the casinos do some kind of a mailing or an email to their list of people who are on the self-exclusion list, brick and mortar, who aren't protected now. So I totally understand it. For a couple hours, we've been talking about how great this is because it's all about the money. Income is phenomenal, thanks to sports betting and online gambling. But I just wanna make sure that we understand behind every one of those millions of dollars is a person and a family that may or may not be able to afford to lose that money. And I think that's what we really need to focus on. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. If you have questions, just let me know. Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Seeing Representative Horn. Slow to the draw there. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Diane, uh, for your work and for your presentation. Um, I, I would sort of push back a little bit that it's not all about the money. In fact, a lot of our conversation in this hearing has been exactly about problem gambling and, and that we are a lot of us focused on, on what those resources look like and what we ought to be doing there. So um, I wanted to ask about um, your, uh, what happens now to, you know, given, given the constraints you're operating under, um, I've read statistics about calls being up you know, exponentially 87% or something like that. What happens now to somebody who calls into you? Are there not, um, um, are you not able to refer them to programs? What, 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 where's the, where's the, where, what's missing there once somebody actually does reach out to you? And you have talked a lot about problem gambling. So I do have to thank you for that. I understand that there are a number of people here who don't think it's all about the money and I appreciate that. Um, so when someone calls our helpline number, it is our goal to get someone into treatment. Um, it is our goal to get them into counseling, but we also have to work on the constraints that this person is under. There are some people who want to give us no information. They want to be completely anonymous. They want to go to Gamblers Anonymous. That's it. Um, there are other people who really want to tell you their entire story and get into one-on-one -on -one counseling. So, so one of the issues for us is it's not a super quick call in a lot of cases. Um, it really takes a while to figure out what people want, what people need, um, and the best place to get these people to go. Um, so not only are the calls, more calls coming in, but the detail of the calls in a lot of cases is also a lot more difficult. And again, we only have a staff of three people. Pre-pandemic, we were five. So it's all hands on deck all the time. I'm getting calls and chats at night all the time because we don't have the staff to be able to manage this. And Burnout's a huge concern with the three of us that are here and not being able to really fund the additional staff that we need. Got it. So just to be so, so, you know, and I don't mean to suggest this anyway. So you are you, under constraints, you are handling the volume of calls that's come in. It's just putting a lot of strain on your existing resources. Correct. And, and is there, I just want to make sure I understand because there are, you know, there are many steps along this path. I'm talking now about people who have identified you as a resource and identified a problem with their own habits. Um, and that once they call you, are, are you, are there instances where you don't have a place to send them? Never. Okay. So that's- we always have a place not, to send them. There's not a deficit in that area now. So principally what we're talking about is, is how we make sure that people are aware of, of the resources and, and um, getting to you in the first place. Right. The quality um, of treatment in this state isn't the issue. Getting people into that quality treatment is the issue. And the helpline really is that bridge. We have problem gamblers over here. We have awesome treatment over here. And the helpline is that bridge that gets people from over there to over there. And without the funding to be able to market that helpline, promote that helpline, make sure that everyone knows there is a helpline, there's a real breakdown in the system. And that funding has normally come from the casinos. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, what would, I mean, if you were to, what, just uh, speaking very theoretically here, um, what kind of staffing, so the issue, there's issues with staffing you have right now in order to maintain, to, to, to manage the volume of calls coming in. Um, first to that question, what would you, what, what would you need in order to manage that? Um, minimum, we'd like two additional staff people, one person to manage the helpline, um, another, and to do some outreach, another person to do training. We think that training is also a great prevention piece. Um, what should you be looking for as problem, far as problem gambling is concerned? Um, we'd like to train bankers. We'd like to tra train business owners. Are you sure no one's embezzling from you? It's happened in the state. We all know that. So we would like to be do, doing more training so that people know the warning signs to look for. And again, let's get these people into treatment before they do something stupid like embezzle. Okay, so then on the other part of this, you, you've made you know um, some specific um, issues, you know, identified some specific issues you know, with um, helplines being flashed too quickly, um, volume dropping on radio ads and the, the fonts being too small. Have you, are you in conversation with the principals here that we've heard for, for this call about those particular problems? 
are, are I mean, is this a, are you working with them on that? Those seem like issues that could be resolved. Yes, there, you would think that those were issues that could be resolved. Um, not all operators are the same. So there are some companies that have been better than others as far as listening to our concerns. Um, I don't know how much more I want to say. <laughs> no, yeah, I, please don't. But, okay. <laughs> some are better than others. Um, it, it has been brought up to everyone. Um, Foxwoods right now is not someone that will that I'm really able to reach out to very much. Um, I've emailed people at Foxwoods and um, they haven't been uh, emailing emailing me back. I, I mean, our, our relationship with Foxwoods right now, I just have to say, isn't that great. I know that they do have a problem gambling committee. I asked if I could be part of that. Um, at the last meeting, the answer was no. Hopefully moving forward, I can be. Um, so it really all depends on the specific operators. Um, one of the other things that we've brought to the table is a customer service phone number. Um, DraftKings and FanDuel, it's very hard to get a customer service person on the phone. So some of the calls that we're getting are people saying, I can't log into my FanDuel account. Mm, that's not the problem that we're thinking when we think of problem gambling. Um, we were hoping that they would have a customer service number that they could call. Um, Sugar House has a great customer service number. I think, you know, since October 7th, I've gotten one phone call about someone who can't log into Sugar House. So there are a big issues here that we're looking at and little issues here that we're looking at. All are making a perfect storm of horribleness at the Connecticut Council. So, and last question, and then I'll pass the time here. Just, it sounds then that that the increase of calls you're experiencing, a chunk of that is people looking for customer service. Some of it is that, yes. But, but the concern for us is we don't want the, our phone number to be buried any more than it is buried. So our feeling is at least you can see the phone number to call, even though it's not the right number to call. Um, so we don't want to give anyone the opportunity to bury our number any further than it's already buried. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. Um, Diane, do you have your budget available for us to review? Sure. Yeah. How much do you get every year? From... No, total. Our budget's around $800,000, $750,000. And and you pay for the three staff that you have. And what else do you pay for out of that? Um, rent, insurance, all of those no, normal things. Right, right. None of it is spent on marketing or advertising at this point. And that's what, that's what, um, uh, that's what the lottery spends theirs on? Uh, the lottery helps us with the helpline. And they also they also said they do some indirect contributions relative to marketing. Correct. We are in rotation in their billboards, things like that. And the um, both uh, Mahegan and Mashantucket um, provide uh, the numbers uh, uh, for problem gambling on their particular marketing materials. Correct. So that's another forum of marketing for you. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I have a uh, representative Howard who has a couple questions. Representative Howard. Yes. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good afternoon, Diane. One thing that you said surprised me. I just want to ask you a bit more about it. So um, I, I, I've dealt a lot with addiction and, and in fact, problem gambling has impacted uh, my life, my family uh, directly. I understand it uh, quite well. One thing that surprised me you said about exclusion is that you have clients who uh, want to exclude from sports betting, but not other part of gambling. And I was surprised to hear that because my experience with all sorts of addiction and gambling is uh, to basically cut it out completely. Can you tell me, even if it's sort of anecdotally, how many people um, are looking to exclude themselves from only certain parts of gambling? Not really. Um, yeah, I don't have a comparison of who wants to exclude from everything and who just wants to do exclude from certain things. Um, but we think it's very important that we meet people where they are. Um, and there's a lot of addiction treatment right now that 
isn't all or nothing. They're thinking that if you cut back on gambling or drinking or drugs, um, that that may work for some people. I'm not gonna judge how anyone's addiction path should work or how anyone's recovery should work, but it's not up to me or anyone to be able to say you have to exclude from everything or nothing. We think that people should have the option to make sure that their treatment plan works for them. It doesn't just fit into our mold. Okay, thank you, Diane, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I see no other questions, Diane. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We have uh, DCP up next. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Sorry, I was having Ms. trouble. Thank you very much. I'm doing my uh, video. And, uh, and uh, we have another former um, uh, legislative person on here, Maureen. Uh, nice to see you, Maureen. It's good to see everybody. Commissioner, go ahead. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here. And as you observed, um, with me is the deputy commissioner at uh, the department, uh, Maureen Magnum. Um, also a number of other people from our agency uh, listening in. Um, first, I just wanna say, uh, well, we had a slide presentation. I don't know if we wanna try to put that up or if I should just go through my remarks. Um, uh, I have, Gina, no, go ahead. Hi, sorry. I'm gonna share my screen if that helps and see if you can uh, go ahead. That would be great. Questions. Thank okay. you. No problem. I did also share with the committee in their email, so they have it as well. Okay, great. Go ahead, Commissioner, see if you can get on. Uh, here it is. Oh, uh, Gina, you shared your screen, but you shared all your files. Gina? Yes, I see it. Once she puts up her, um, it'll block my files. Go ahead, Commissioner. Can you get on there? Oh, am I? Yeah, she wants you to put your. Um... Oh, okay. Try it. I'm not certain. It's not I... letting us. Yeah, I think Maureen was going to try to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, since you have it, I think in the interest, it's been, I know, a long day. We'll, I'll just go through um, talking okay, points. Yeah. And... Thank you. Unfortunately, yeah, people on TV can't follow along, but um, <laughs> you guys can. So, so to begin, um, I do appreciate the opportunity um, to be able to update the committee. Just um, at a high level, I want to say that, um, you know, we, we've been really pleased so far with how uh, things have been going. This has been the most significant expansion and modernization of gaming landscape um, for the state really since casinos first opened on the reservations and, and gambling really became something in the state. Um, and we're comfortable so far with how the rollout's been going. Um, we think we've launched a marketplace that we opened quickly and really stayed true to the goals of the statute and, and the charge that was given to us. Um, it's really you know a well-regulated regulated market and it's one that we think Connecticut residents can have confidence in. And we've been pleased so far with our kind of relationship and working relationship with the operators. Um, you know, this is a new market, a lot of um, new rules going on, not a lot of learning on our end about how they operate. Um, but so far um, that's been going smoothly. Oh, it looks like maybe this has been opened up. All right, so Perfect. I was just getting to where we are in slide two. So in terms, and we've been talking a lot about this, but in terms of what we're actually seeing in the state, um, th this is sort of the scope of what this expansion has entailed. We have now online sports wagering available throughout the entire state by all three of the operators. Um, there's online casino and fantasy contests are now available throughout the state um, by our state's two tribal partners and, and the businesses they're working with. We also have retail sports betting available, uh, multiple locations in Connecticut, in addition to on the reservations. And then there's additional casino um, online gaming that's been authorized and is coming, specifically iLottery and online casino. And go to slide three. Um, this is just sort of a, a summary of sort of the retail rollout and where in addition to on people's phones, um, there are now these nine currently lo open locations in the state for people to go. 
Um, next slide. Um, so this really, and I'm not going to read all this, don't worry, um, but this, since the legislature passed this law expanding gaming in May, a lot has happened and, and it happened quickly. In fact, normally I would have started my presentation uh, acknowledging the whole DCP team, many of whom are, are watching and available to correct me if I say something wrong, but I really wanted to wait till this slide um, to, to thank all of them. And this is really gives you a visual of how much was accomplished in a few short months. Um, although it didn't seem short at the time. Um, so while I'm not gonna go through all these bullets as you look through them later, um, since you have these, I think it's important to remember that each of these maybe hits a milestone, but an enormous amount of work um, occurred from a dedicated team at DCP to hit each of these milestones um, and to hit them in the sort of time frame that the state was hoping for. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is in these numbers have been talked about. So really this one in the next slide, uh, we can go through quickly. Um, this kind of gives a feel for um, how much activity um, is being seen in the state. And, um, you know, so, so a lot of being wagered. It's important to remember that that's not necessarily all new money. So people put in some money, win some, lose some, rebet some of their winnings. So, so it's not that that much entirely is at stake. Um, the next slide will show, which we've talked about, um, sort of the revenues um, that the state is starting to see from expanded gaming, which, um, again, all this information um, is also available on our website. So we have a, a whole statistics page so people can track um, the progress of this market. Um, you can go to slide seven. Um, so a really important part of the work that went into all this um, was creating the regulatory structure and sort of setting the rules of the game for how online gaming and retail sports betting was going to work. Um, so that took a, that was involved a lot of work, and um, I think it did require we spent a lot of time analyzing the bill itself and the law. And we know it reflected a lot of compromises. And I think the discussion today, you see that people kind of came out different ways on where things are. Um, but we, we really worked hard. We looked at what other states were doing. We talked to all our counterparts. We talked to, and got input from um, the, the tribal partners of the state, the Connecticut Lottery Corporation, other businesses that are in the marketplace, either as service providers or as operators. And I think, again, I'm not gonna read through all the, all the different things we touched on, but what we really have in Connecticut is a comprehensive set of regulations that we think appropriately balance a lot of competing interests and expectations. And um, we think is really setting up Connecticut for, for a market that uh, people can have some confidence in. Um, so next I wanna touch on uh, problem gaming. It's come up a lot during this and I wanna kind of emphasize the work that we've been doing at uh, DCP to really talk about, to, to really address this concern. It's something that was sort of built into the law uh, as an issue that the state should be thinking about. And um, that's something we've done. So first we launched the state's first several centralized self-exclusion list. So there, there were some different ways that the different businesses de dealt with this, but now there's um, a centralized list that everyone can work off of. It allows people to self-exclude for one, five years or for a lifetime. Um, so th that's an important addition. Um, but self-exclusion is just one piece of this. We built into our regulations a ton, of, a lot of features to really give patrons the tools that they need to perhaps recognize that maybe their gaming is going too far and that they have a problem and then where to get help if, if they're starting to recognize um, that they're gaming above and beyond which what maybe they're comfortable with. So first of all, throughout um, the websites, there needs to be information on the problem gaming and a message of, you know, the phone number to call, how to get help for problem gaming. So it, it shows up on the login and on, log off screen. Um, all the retail locations have to have it. There's a patron uh, protection page that each operator needs to have that will include this information. Also, there's a lifetime deposit limit um, of $2,500. And once you hit deposited that amount, you'll get the message with uh, 
details and information on how to set some limits or uh, get on the self-exclusion list. And you'll start getting that every six months. Um, we also are requiring the platforms to make sure patrons have uh, notifications about the amount of time and the amount of money they're spending on gaming so that everybody has a way to recognize that, oh, maybe I'm spending a lot more time on here than I realized, or I've spent a lot more than I realized. Um, and we want people to have that visibility into that so then they can when they log off or go to the patron protection page and, and start thinking about how to do that. Um, we also uh, require each platform to have a way for patrons to pl place limits on themselves. Maybe they don't want to um, exclude themselves altogether, but they realize that sometimes uh, it gets out of hand when they're in the middle of the game. And so um, they need to be allowed to place either time limits or deposit or spend limits on their accounts so that they can, can manage if um, and limit themselves. Um, we also require all employees at our licensees who are going to be interacting with patrons um, to take problem gaming training. And that training course needs to have been approved by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, an operator is not allowed to induce somebody to continue gaming um, when the person tries to stop or is closing the app or, or, you know, right after they lose a wager or something. So there's that. In addition, um, some of the operators have play for free games to try to get people um, comfortable with some of their games and uh, they're not allowed to use those free versions to give people a false sense of what that likelihood of winning is going to look like. Um, in addition, we have, um, as you know, was discussed uh, just before, any advertising needs to include the problem gaming message as well. So in addition to being on the websites at the login, at the log off, it, it's required in all the advertising as well. And we're continuing to look at how, what else or what more should we be doing? So we meet um, every other week with um, the Connecticut Council on Problem Gaming and our partners at uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And we have a team at DCP who meets with them regularly. So with that, I know there was a lot discussed. Um, happy to answer any questions. I think you're on mute. I was. Um, uh, again, we appreciate um, the presentation. We appreciate all that we put on your plate in the last year um, from the legis legislation that we passed, uh, both this and, and the cannabis legislation. We uh, actually um, uh, look forward to not dealing with DCP this year. All due respect, Commissioner. <laughs> we like you, but we'd like not to deal with you. Just like you. Uh, am I allowed things. to say the feelings mutual? <laughs> you, are. you absolutely are. Um, you know, I know that there will be some things that come up and we um, have some tweaking. Um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the interstate, intrastate uh, components of things. And I know that we passed a bill back in 16 or 17 relative to fantasy sports was which was going to keep the two separate and I don't know if we combine the two in the overall legislation um, just from a purely technical component of it did we combine the two because I know we intended back in 17 or 16 to keep them separate but we did not um, so right. at least it seems that we did not so you you're following the legislation yeah, so the, the bill that was passed um, rolled fantasy contests into the definition of an internet game. Okay. And so the, the, the way the bill is written is it categorizes it and sort of then throughout, because as it talks about internet games, it treats it the same as sports wagering or iCasino. Okay, so if we wanted to fix that, it would have to be an amendment or a standalone piece of legislation to do so? Yeah, so that would be, you know, that would definitely be sort of on the level of a policy shift relative to what the law currently says. And then, of course, we would take a look at our regs to, to follow whatever the new law directs us to do. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to have some clarification because I know when we originally passed the 16 or 17 legislation that we were intending to do fantasy separate from 
uh, the online gaming components, online and sports betting. And so um, I just wanted to, you know, try to figure out um, what happened in, I, you know, I, I think we took the bill as directed by the executive branch. And so I think we have to go back to them and talk to them a little bit too. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Representative Horn. Thank you, Senator, um, and thank you for all the work you've done on this. And yes, quite a bit of uh, interaction with us trying to to uh, manage the various pieces of large legislation we sent your way. Um, and I don't know whether uh, you are going to feel comfortable answering this question, but I wanted to ask straight up following on Senator Austin's question about the distinction between um, fantasy uh, sports and um, sports betting um, and whether We've heard a lot of testimony about that, obviously, whether you have a viewpoint at all as to whether the two should be regulated differently. So I, I guess a couple of things. One, I mean, we we did actually in some areas carve out some some treatment of fantasy contests differently, recognizing some differences. I think at a high level, this is going to be kind of a, a policy decision, certainly when people you know, you, you are creating an account and connect and, and you're betting or wagering or using an entry fee, I guess is what it is, you know, real, real money there. So, so there is some similarities. And so, um, you know, it, it's complicated as to finding that balance of how, how much do you want to reduce friction and allowing people to do it um, similar to what other states did? And how much do you, you believe this, same types of rules that were in place for sports wagering and I casino belong there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I recognize that it's a it's a policy question, but it, it does they do seem to have structural differences that that to what others have said before me that we ought to recognize while still wanting them to be you know protect consumers. Um, so thank you. That's all I have for the moment. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? So I see no further questions. Um, Representative Horn, would you like to make any closing comments? Sure. Um, I, I guess I, I, I'm really grateful for all the expertise that people have brought to this and the good faith negotiation. I think I, do, I am convinced that everybody who was on this long meeting today is, is trying to get to a good result. Um, it's complicated and, and sometimes talking about it and good communication is, uh, is, is, does maybe a better job than legislation, but clearly I think we've identified some things that maybe we need to clarify and, um, and address in the future. So my thanks for everybody and for all the committee members. Nice to see everybody. Senator Champagne. Any closing comments, sir? I'm sorry if he's still on. Oh, Representative Howard. Yeah, just uh, thank you to everybody who, who testified today and answered questions, help us get a good, clear picture. And just to uh, echo Representative Horn, it, it's important that we all work together. And I look forward to continuing to working with everybody who, who testified today and has interest in this, as well as the, the rest of my uh, colleagues in the upcoming session. So I look forward to seeing everybody again soon. And thank you very much. Uh, and and thank you all. And um, I would just like to say that we have some uh, things that we will be requesting um, from uh, uh, Demas. We will be requesting how they're spending the dollars relative to uh, the lottery um, money that's gone through. Uh, we also will be requesting from CCPG um, how they uh, parse out their dollars um, relative to the resources that they get. And um, uh, I think that uh, that gets us where we need to be. Um, and we may be asking uh, FanDuel and uh, DraftKings for some recommendations relative to policy changes that we may consider um, uh, to uh, address their issues. So again, um, I'm very glad that we're at this point where we're ironing out the minor uh, differences that we may have to do because um, uh, having dealt with this particular issue for the last five or six years, or maybe even longer, um, I think that we are in a very good place. And I'm glad 
all of uh, our partners um, have been working well together. Uh, uh, Mashantucket, uh, Mohegan, uh, Lottery, uh, DCP, CCPG. I perceive um, everybody putting their best foot forward and, and working on all of these issues together. Again, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all in person one day soon, very soon. And uh, I, I can't wait uh, uh, to, uh, this is five years in, in our rear view mirror. So we have the data that we need. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Madam Chair.